Hello, brothers and sisters. This is A.T. and Marcy Arneson. We're so grateful you're joining us today for this wonderful day of teaching on the topic of Bible and gender. We just want to say thanks so much for taking the time to come on in today. We've got a lot of teaching coming your way. Some of you will watch this in its entirety, about four hours of teaching today. Some of you may break it up into different chunks and watch it over the coming weeks, but we're just so glad as disciples we get a time like this. I remember as a young Christian going to Bible Jubilees and days of teaching and learning God's word. Mm. We hope uh, to let this be the start of uh, another era like that in the Chicago church where we can take time to dive deeply into God's word, whether it be a book of the Bible or even a topic like we're covering today on Bible and gender. Yes, it's so great to be with you. Thank you so much for taking the time and joining us. We hope that today, and if you watch this throughout the week, really fills your heart. I'm Amen. so grateful, especially as a woman, that we can use God's word, look at Bible and gender, and understand truth and understand the kind of conviction that God is calling us to have. You know, we're asking us today to sit back, get out our notepads, and be active listeners. There'll be uh, time to participate by sending in questions. You'll get information in the video. And so yeah. we ask that you write down your questions. Please send in your responses, send in your questions. It'll help form and shape the teaching days that we'll have in the future. But we're so grateful to be in the family of God. We're so grateful to have a time where we can process God's word. So we hope you enjoy this day. Growing up, I felt the tension of two different churches. And the reason was because my parents went to two different churches. On the one side was a church that was very much like many of the churches in my community. Um, there was a man who, who was the minister who would speak on Sundays, but most of everything else that was done in church was done by women. The women were clearly the spiritual leaders of the church. They led the missionary boards, the usher boards, um, every committed committee or organization, as well as nearly every woman that I'm speaking of also worked all day long, had children, um, our grandchildren. I mean, there was so much pressure and so much responsibility on the women of the church. In 1975, I was 13 years old and I was introduced to the Midland Park Church of Christ by my aunt. I loved the warmth of the people and the love they had for the Bible. I was amazed that I could actually understand the sermons and the Bible started to come alive for me. I saw the women setting up the communion trays and organizing potlucks, but there was really no leadership roles for women. Although I took note that my aunt always led a women's Bible study group in her home. I was converted August 5th of 1979 and in the early days of the campus ministry, I could remember there was a time that sisters could not say amen. Sometime later, there was a sister, really she was a, a, a sister who was a leader in the church and her last name was Nussbaum. When the preacher made a really good point, she would just bob her head like this. And so, of course, the sisters took note of that. And we started when the preacher would say, a, a, say something that was really great and we agreed, it was from the scriptures. We start, everybody saw, all the sisters start doing this, bopping their heads. And we gave it a name, we call it the Nussbaum Nod. On the other side of the coin was the traditional Church of Christ. The thing that I noticed about that church, yes, the, the church was actually led by men mostly. I, women did not do much in the church at all. But what I loved about the church and what made me want to be a part of it is the incredible reverence and respect for God's word. In 1984, I was in college and I started attending the New York City Church of Christ. And I was amazed by the campus women that were studying the Bible with me. They knew their Bibles and they started answering questions that I'd always had. And I hadn't seen that before besides my aunt. And I was inspired that I could actually learn to do that, that I started to have a vision that I could teach other women, that I could help other women in their lives. I went into the ministry in 1986 at 24 years old, and I loved getting trained by the older women in the church. 
to lead Bible studies, Bible discussion groups, and to teach classes. It was so inspiring to be a part of a vibrant, growing women's ministries in the 80s and 90s, where women's lives were being impacted and changed by Jesus. I was baptized in 1984, July of 1984. And then uh, two years later, I heard about an opportunity in a church in Florida where they were hiring interns, both men and women. And so I moved down in hopes of one day being able to work for the church, and I had that opportunity. When I was about a year old in my faith, back in 1986, back in the day, I was asked to lead a discipleship group. Believe me, I did not have any ambition to lead and actually was a little bit intimidated, uh, but I wanted to serve God in whatever way He wanted. When I was five years old, my parents planted the church in Manila, Philippines. Even though much was lost on me as a little girl, I grew up seeing prominent women leaders and women truly making a difference in the world. Being able to see my mom in Bible studies, doing women's lessons and leading alongside my dad helped to give me dreams for myself and the impact that I could someday make in the world. I've had the honor and privilege of serving in the full-time ministry for 27 years in the Chicago Church of Christ. And during that time, there have been some downs and some ups. There were some times definitely when I felt that some men and even women were leading harshly and humanistically. So yes, there were times I felt that my thoughts were not valued or considered, um, but I just held to my conviction and survived those times. And I am grateful that perseverance develops character. Towards the end of the 90s and the early 2000s, it was a much more challenging time to be in the ministry, trying to balance the intensified ministry demands and raising a young family. It was a time of pressure and it was a more difficult time in the women's ministry. It has been a tremendous ride. Some really high points as well as some painful low points. Uh, but I feel that overall as a church, we have been just stumbling our way forward the best we can and figuring out what is, what is going to glorify God. Uh, so I think that we will continue to do so. Uh, we'll continue to find our way. I trust that we will. God has matured the church and things have changed tremendously. We're considered, what we say is important. They consider what we say and make the decisions for the congregation. This is a very exciting time in God's kingdom. I'm grateful now at this time of my life to be serving in the ministry in a time of more grace and to be in a church that values the women's role and wants each of us to thrive. I am also just so grateful for my coworkers in the Chicago church, both men and women, who do not lead with a heavy hand, but with love and teamwork. And I'm grateful that God can and does use all of us, no matter our role, in many different ways for His glory and to accomplish His good work. One thing that has been constant and I'm so grateful for is the partnership with the brothers and sisters here in Chicago as we call each other higher and strive to be our best for God. I so appreciate the willingness that the church leadership has had to engage in and have open discussions on topics like Bible and gender. It has truly helped me to grow and be more like Jesus as I serve in the ministry. I've been extremely blessed to watch and learn from some amazing women as I've grown up. I've been blessed to work alongside not only inspiring women, but incredible men that truly helped me feel valued and needed. I feel that my voice is listened to and my perspectives are important. I feel grateful to be in the ministry in Chicago and a part of a strong partnership of men and women leaders trying to help reconcile the world to Christ. Hello, brothers and sisters. We are A.T. and Marcy Arneson, and we wanted to kick off today with a heartfelt welcome to this day of teaching on the topic of gender roles here in the Chicago church. You know, we're very excited that you'll be taking a journey with us today. A lot of work has gone into what is going to be presented. We're going to be looking at six sections of biblical text out of God's Word, and we're going to be unpacking the context, the cultural meanings, the interpretations, and even some of the applications on how those texts impact the church today. Our topic, again, is Bible and gender. Specifically, how do we view the meaning and the directives of God's Word 
as it applies to how men and women function in their various roles of influence, leadership, and giftedness in the ecclesia or among God's people in the church today. We are very excited that you will be taking a journey with us today. I'm also eager to be with you and share my experience as a woman who has been a disciple of Jesus for 29 years and has had the privilege of serving in the full-time ministry for 27 years here in the Chicago Church of Christ. I'm grateful to be a part of a fellowship of believers that continue to learn and grow using God's word as our foundation. It is always a good reminder to me that God's word is inspired by the Holy Spirit, Amen. written by men to protect us, build us up, guide us, and lead us to know God more and more. And that same Holy Spirit that inspired the scripture that says, come to me all you are weary and I will give you rest, is the same Holy Spirit that inspired the men to write the scriptures that we will read today. I'm so grateful for these discussions and conversations where I used to have hesitancy and doubt in my role, I now have confidence and understanding. We are very excited that you will be taking a journey with us today. Amen. You know, we are excited about how this day is going to unfold and how it'll flow and keep us engaged and attentive to what's being shared. You know, both from a teaching standpoint and from a heart inspiration standpoint, we've got a lot planned for today. Again, a lot of hours have gone into the presentations you're going to be hearing today. And we want to thank each of the teachers and the participants for pouring out their hearts so that we can all learn and grow to understand God's word in a better way. Amen. After some introductory comments and some explanation here, we're going to dive right into some sharing followed by the six sections of teaching. And I think this will be rich for all of us and it'll be engaging. In between each of the six sections of teaching, we'll have some of our very dear sisters right here from the Chicago Church. They'll come on and give their testimonies. We're calling them interludes. Uh, they'll share their experience as women, some for decades who've served among God's people in various roles, using their gifts to glorify God. Mm -hmm. So we think this time is gonna be filled with excellent teaching, It'll spark our imaginations. It might raise questions in our hearts that we need to get answered. And it'll keep us intrigued in the mysteries of God's word. But it'll also inspire our hearts with some honest and heartfelt sharing. So here's what we're asking of everybody who's participating today. Please pay, take the time today or in the coming weeks to watch this presentation in its entirety. We know it's a lot, but please invest in what's being presented to you today in the coming weeks. As you listen, be an active participant. Put your social media uh, 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 platforms away, put your cell phone away unless you're using it for a Bible, and let's get out our notepads and our Bibles and let's participate. We're actually asking you to ask questions or write down questions yeah. in each, each section being presented today, and later on you'll be directed how to send those questions in so that we can process those and present them in a teaching time down the road. You know what? We want you to be reminded uh, to keep an open mind and an open heart as the presentations come before you. Many of the passages being covered today have been debated and hotly contested, let's say, for a thousand years of Christianity. Mm -hmm. There are lots and lots of opinions on some of these passages and variations of thought. These are very complex and difficult passages we're covering today. And today we do not speak as having uncovered ultimate truth in every nuance, uh, on every nuance of the scriptures being covered today. But rather today is our best attempt to understand these texts and provide the most unified and accurate application that we can in the Chicago church. Yeah. And so lastly, I wanna say this, and I think this is very important. We strongly, strongly encourage each of us to work very hard to let God's word, the very scriptures themselves, frame our thinking. It is so important that our biblical view forms our worldview and not the other way around. We cannot let our worldview shape our biblical view. We view the world through the lens of God's word. So let's settle in with our Bibles, our notebooks, get some tea, some coffee, some water, whatever you need to do to actively participate in this day. And let's enjoy this day of inspiration and teaching. Please pray with me. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your word. God, thank you for 
the thousands of years that the word has been carried through the hearts of your people into our hearts today. God, we ask that you would keep us attentive, keep us engaged, and let this be a wonderful day of inspiration and teaching, and let our hearts overflow with gratitude for the guidance you give us through your amazing scriptures. God, thank you for the ways you use the Holy Spirit to illuminate truth in our lives and truth to the world. And I pray that today is a demonstration of the power of the gospel to knit our hearts together and to honor you with our lives. Please bless this day of teaching and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. In this section for the next few minutes, we wanna connect what's happening today on this day of teaching here in Chicago to a process that's unfolding across our entire fellowship in the International Churches of Christ. Before we dive in, we thought it would be important for us to highlight the process and build a timeline so that we understand that we're on a journey together that unites our entire global fellowship. We also want you to know at the outset that the teaching you're hearing today is not just what is being taught here in the Chicago church, but it is in unity and in harmony with what's being taught in the churches in the Midwest family of churches, all 20 of them, and what's being taught in our churches all across the world. Let me begin in the fall of 2018. At a leadership conference in Panama City, Panama, a request was made that our global teachers group called the Teacher Service Team form a task force team and begin writing a deep biblical dive into some of the, the more uh, complex passages that describe men's and women's roles in the scriptures. The teachers accepted the assignment, formed their team, and went to work. That was in October of 2018. For two years, the teachers put themselves to this work. They sought counsel, they gathered together, they did tons and tons of hours of work and reading and contemplation, and they refined a paper that was completed in January of 2020. In February of 2020, a meeting of those same, many of those same leadership representatives were gathering from every part of our global fellowship in Jakarta, Indonesia. One of the top priority goals of this gathering was for the global teachers after this two year time of building this, uh, this uh, kind of academic approach to looking at these scriptures that these teachers would come to this meeting, present their final 105 page draft and they entitled it, The Bible and Gender. It should be noted that the goal of this difficult assignment on the teacher side was not to come up with practical application of, of how we viewed men's and women's roles in the churches, but rather to do an exegetical study of some of the more difficult to interpret passages. And that is exactly what the teachers did. They wanted the practical application to be processed in each of the regional families around the world. So they provided cultural context kind of a, an idea of what was the original author's intent to the original audience at the original time of the writing of these scriptures. The plan for all of 2020, coming out of these Jakarta meetings, had several steps that would bring this paper and the work of the teachers into the entirety of our global fellowship. Let me describe just a few of those steps to you and give you some of the details so that you understand our global fellowship is, is, I think, very unique in that we work together to try and land in the same places and maintain that unity of the spirit. So upon the presentation in Jakarta, the paper was handed out to everybody in attendance there. And step number one was distribute and read the 105 page paper. Every person in attendance in Jakarta was to read the paper thoroughly and in its entirety, all 105 pages. We were then asked to distribute this paper to every church leader couple across the whole world in every regional family so that they too could begin reading the paper. The church leaders were then asked to put the paper into the hands of the core leaderships of every local congregation, about 720 plus churches around the world. And the paper was also published on IPI books and made available to anyone outside of those groups who was interested in diving in and studying these scriptures. That was step one, distribution and reading. Step two, we wanted to establish practical guidelines from the paper. There are 34 regional families that make up our entire global fellowship. Once the paper had been read and studied by the leadership in each of those regional families, the church leaders, the teachers, and the elders, they were to gather together, 
to form guidelines and practical applications for how in their part of the world they would view these scriptures being applied in the local church context. The goal of this local processing was to establish two sets of information. Number one, what, how, how did that practical application fall within guidelines that could be applied in our local settings? But also number two, what did we feel was outside of our comfortability of interpreting the scriptures that we would not want to be applied in that local context and in the local church setting? So step two was to establish these practical guidelines, both within the comfort of what we feel interpreted those scriptures correctly, but also outside of what we were comfortable saying those scriptures meant. Step three, reporting of those regional guidelines and conclusions to the elder service team. After the formation of guidelines in every regional family around the world, those regional families are to write up a report of their meetings, their conclusions, and their practical applications along with their kind of local context understandings and send that into our global elders service team. And we're very proud here in Chicago to know that Darren and Sharon represent the Midwest and the Chicago church in serving on that elders overseeing group. The elder service team then would take all 34 of those reports, they would review each of these reports, looking to see if generally across the world we were all landing in the same place. And with most of these reports turned in already, it's important to note that across the entire ICOC, the International Church of Christ, with some exceptions for cultural norms, we have all landed in very similar places in how we interpret the practical application of the passages that you will hear today that will be presented to you. This is really good news. Given the wide diversity of our global fellowship and considering the very broad spectrum of cultures represented in our fellowship across the world, we all generally landed on the same guidelines and the same conclusions. And so the final step was that we begin teaching on the topic of Bible and gender in every church across the global fellowship. So here we are today after a three year countless hour process, so much work participating in this very unified process with our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world. What we did not know in those meetings in February of 2020 as we left Jakarta was that three weeks later we would be locked down in the pandemic that we've now come accustomed to. The goal in February of 2020 was to have this whole teaching process completed by December of 2020. Well here we are just a little shy of one year behind but I think we all mostly understand that that timeline had to be shifted. So we're so grateful for all who put their hand to this work as we continue in this unified process with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Hi, I'm Sharon Goche. I serve as a women's ministry leader here in the Chicago church, along with my husband who serves as an evangelist and elder. Hello, I'm Nancy Dawson, and I too serve as a women's ministry leader in the Chicago church with my friend Sharon, and uh, along with my husband who also serves as an elder and evangelist in the Chicago church as well. Back in February of 2020, right before the pandemic, there was a group that gathered together in Jakarta, in Indonesia. It was the regional family chair people and a number of el members of the elder service team and people in the catalyst team in the church. And if you're not sure who those groups are, you'll, you'll find out soon. But anyway, those, we got together in that group and in, as a part of the program, the ICOC teacher service team did a, uh, presented a draft of their paper, the gender roles paper, which is a very uh, subject matter that we're gonna be talking about over the next few hours in this workshop. But uh, they presented a, a draft and the men and women of the ICOC teacher service team had spent months in a study and preparation working on this document. And they didn't just end it with uh, working on the document, they actually used that time in Jakarta to get input from those who were there to see if there were any spots that might have been missed or anything that needed to be added. And then they took those comments, went back to the uh, drawing board, so to speak, and continued to revise the paper so that they were able to present a final document June of last year. So um, when we got that document, then we took it to all the different regional families throughout the world, and those families uh, started to look at what was it gonna look like in that 
culture and in that family. So that's where we are today. The Midwest took the paper, we um, organized a task force to look at it and to talk about what it was gonna mean here in the Midwest. Nancy was a part of that task force. Yes, and for me, it really was a labor of love. It was really hard on my body to sit in that chair for that long, looking at this, but 100 plus pages, but it was a labor of love to go through that with um, several others from the Midwest Family of Churches, and all of us read through the paper multiple times uh, before we came together. But we distilled it down to about 24 pages, only 24, of little bite-sized chunks so that it would be easier to teach the different congregations in the Midwest. Um, I love the opening quote from the Bible and gender that reminds us how much God loves humanity. And of course, the ultimate expression of his love was sending his son for us. And God's love was also expressed in, and I quote from the, the Bible and gender, the movement of the Holy Spirit on the hearts of humans to direct them to record scripture for the edification and instruction of humanity. The quote goes on to remind us, God's wisdom is without limit. And in his wisdom, he created humans, both female and male. Gender is a God thing. I love that. But I appreciate so much through this process, just the spirit of unity and cooperation here in the Midwest and how as a fellowship of churches, we agreed to use the scholarship of our global teachers to tackle this controversial subject to the best of our ability with careful exegesis, attempting to draw the meaning out, not putting our meaning in. And I'm also grateful that we have excellent English translations of the Bible that we can trust. And that's done by Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic scholars. I'm grateful that I don't have to know the original language myself. I'm thankful that God values women and has given us amazing roles that enable us to serve Him wholeheartedly. That God has made us strong and suitable helpers. We as women are a fitting counterpart to man. We act alongside Him to help fulfill God's purposes for mankind and to make humanity complete, not inferior in any way, but actually indispensable in our role. Just as the Trinity has the Father as the head, as well as the Son and the Spirit, with different roles. I'm just God's servant, no matter what capacity that is in, but I always feel used by him, useful to him as his vessel. What an honor and a joy. I don't need to seek my own glory or have a selfish ambition. It's far more glorious to seek his glory and see the amazing things he will do. I also appreciate the roles and organization uh, they help us function as God's church, as any organization needs structure to accomplish its purposes. God has also given the church structure and leadership guidelines in His Word, a benevolent and spiritual hierarchy that's not bad, but is healthy and good. Finally, I'm so grateful that our gender, ethnicity, economic status, etc., play no role in our value before God, as God makes clear in Galatians 3. Our identity is in Christ alone. We all know from Galatians 2.20, we've been crucified with Christ and no longer live, but live for Him. Thanks so much, Nancy. Um, yes, so now uh, it's time for you to get out your notebooks, get a pen. It's gonna be a great time of learning over the next few hours in this workshop. We're gonna start off at the very beginning, which is Genesis. So. Prepare yourself for a great day and a great time of learning God's Word. Hello, my name is Tanner Versage. This is Kurt Simmons, and we are on the ministry staff in the Chicago Church of Christ here. We are excited to be a part of this great study on the Bible and gender. And this morning, Kurt and I have the opportunity to talk to you guys about Genesis 1 through 3 and the function that creation and the fall play in our understanding and the application of gender roles in the Bible. Now, to be honest, we don't know if we drew the short straw on this or if we lucked out on this assignment. In many ways, there are a lot of buzzwords that will not come up from our lesson. Genesis 1 through 3 is largely principle in its orientation. Uh, we, you will likely not hear anything from us that, that ruffles your feathers in any sort of way, but at the same time, 
Genesis 1 through 3 is incredibly significant in our theological understanding of God and of the Bible. There is so much in here and we only have about 27 more minutes to unpack that. And so that's the hard part of what we're going to be doing today, but we're excited nonetheless. Kurt and I both have this slightly obsessive appreciation of the book of Genesis. We both order commentaries when we don't need to. We both turn back to this book all the time when we just want to connect to God and connect to his word in a new way. So in that way, we are very excited about what we have the opportunity to present to you guys this morning. A few words uh, come to my mind when I think about this portion of scripture in Genesis 1 through 3. First, I find it so incredibly fascinating. Uh, in these three chapters alone, I learn a lot about God, his power, his creativity, his kindness, his protection, and yes, even his expectations. I discover how the amazing creation came to be and that I'm a special part of that creation. I watch the serpent, the enemy of God, as he works to deceive Eve, and I see the entrance of sin and disobedience into the human realm as both Adam and Eve choose to listen to the lie of the devil. It, it's so incredibly fascinating. Another word that comes to my mind is frustrating. I'm sure that most, if not all of that, is a direct result of my pride, thinking that I need and I deserve to know more information than what God is giving to me. There's just so many questions I have that are still unanswered from these three chapters in Genesis. I want more specific information on the creation. I want to know more about the Garden of Eden and about the serpent. I want to know what was going on behind the scenes when God created the world and the angels were watching the creation. But I don't have access to any of that information in these chapters, so that can be just a little bit frustrating. But more than anything else, the word that comes to my mind is fulfilling. I actually have the necessary information to live my life the way God wants me to live it. I know God made the world, and I know God made me, and I know he made me special, and that I was created in his image. And I know that God has a plan for me. And I know that God wants the best for me. And I know that I have an enemy who is trying to lie to me about all of that. And I know that I need to resist him and simply listen to God and trust in his goodness. So it's so fulfilling. Now, because we don't have time to read through all three chapters of Genesis here, allow me to give you a brief synopsis. In chapter one, of course, we have the introduction of God and his creation of the heavens and the earth with the creation of man and woman as his final and most glorious creation. In chapter two, we have a more detailed account of the creation of Adam and Eve and their relationship. And then we get a little bit of information about the home that God gives them in the Garden of Eden and the specific instructions that God gives to Adam and Eve about what they can and can't do. And we know in chapter three, we're introduced to the serpent and we watch his successful efforts to persuade Eve and of course Adam to disobey God's directions, even causing them to doubt God's motives in giving them that direction. We also learn about the punishment that God gives to Satan and then the punishment given to Adam and Eve and how he expelled them from the Garden of Eden to protect them from gaining further access to the tree of life. Now, before we move on to discuss some specific passages from Genesis, I think it's important to talk about how our enemy works to lie to us, just as he did back in Genesis. From the beginning pages of the Bible, we learn that every human being has immense value in the eyes of God. All people, men and women, are incredibly special to God. But Satan enters our time and space and does what he does better than anything else. He lies. And he lies a lot about this topic of value and importance. As the accuser, Satan lies to us, tempting us to feel undervalued, not feeling special or important to God. And this lie that sadly many have believed through the ages has caused a great deal of damage and destruction to the human race. 
And as the deceiver, the devil lies to us by tempting us to feel overvalued or better than our fellow human beings, often based on things like wealth, social status, education, physical stature, looks, race, and yes, even gender. Sadly, many have believed this lie as well, and it too has caused a great deal of damage and destruction in our world. I believe many problems in our world today could be eliminated if people simply agreed with what God has always stated and what the Bible has always affirmed. Every person, man or woman, is created in the image of God and therefore special and immensely valuable to Him. As we can all rightly affirm, we are God's offspring. So now, here's an important question that deserves some consideration. If men and women are different, and if they are assigned different roles, are they still of equal value and importance? And I would answer that question with an emphatic yes. And when we realize this to be true, I believe we become much more secure and at peace in all areas of our lives. So now let's go to the scriptures and let's consider a few passages from Genesis that I believe will help establish this truth. The first of these scriptures is found in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 27. So let's read it now. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. A few things in this passage stand out to me. First, both men and women were created in the image of God. Now, without going into a discussion about what that specifically means, I think we can agree that it doesn't mean that man is more valuable or more important than the woman, nor the woman more valuable or important than the man. Nobody, nobody has the right to say that man was created more in the image of God than woman was, or vice versa. No one has the right to say that because God didn't say that. Second, God gave both the man and the woman the duty to rule over the creation. Again, we don't see that man was given greater responsibility in that directive, nor was woman given lesser responsibility. It seems clear to me that God believed that both the man and the woman would be active and capable in that role. The next passage I would like us to consider is found in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18. And there we read this passage. The Lord God said... It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. This statement was made right before God created Eve from Adam's side. And it's a scripture that has been misunderstood and sadly misused by many people through the years, often to make a claim for man's superiority over woman. Now the supposed logic goes like this. Since Eve is called Adam's suitable helper, that must make her inferior or less valuable than Adam. But the fact that Eve is considered a suitable helper in no way diminishes her value, nor does it state that she is inferior to Adam. The idea of a helper being inferior is simply a worldly point of view. The phrase suitable helper in this passage is from two Hebrew words, ezer konegdo. And that phrase has great significance in the scriptures. Instead of weakness or inferiority, it is much more an indication of capability as well as strength and power. And it never infers that the person in the role of ezer konegdo is inferior in any way. Actually, there are 16 times in the Old Testament when God is referred to as the suitable helper for Israel, using that same phrase, Ezra Konegdo. But 
we would never conclude that God was considering himself to be less than the nation of Israel as their suitable helper. In all ways, God was Israel's strength and definitely capable in helping them. Even in our world today, most people wouldn't consider a suitable helper to be either inferior to or superior to the one they're helping. For example, coaches are suitable helpers, but they aren't considered less than those they are coaching. Teachers are also suitable helpers, but they aren't considered less than the students they're teaching. Doctors and nurses are suitable helpers, but they aren't considered less than the patients they're helping. And parents are definitely suitable helpers to their children, but they aren't considered less than their children. Being called the suitable helper for Adam in no way diminished Eve's value or importance in the eyes of God. It more accurately indicated her power and strength and especially her ability. Then we read in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 23 about Adam's joy in regard to Eve's creation as he viewed her for the very first time. Here we, we sense great excitement and appreciation, but nothing about superiority or feeling that he was above Eve. It reads in Genesis 2, 23, Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. Now, I don't believe that Adam ever felt that he was greater than Eve. But it is clear that he was profoundly grateful that God had brought her to him to be a part of his existence. It was never about, I'm better than you for Adam, but much more about, I need you, Eve. It's as though Adam was proclaiming, hallelujah, my different but powerful and capable equal has arrived. And then when you think about it, it's quite apparent that both Adam and Eve needed each other to carry out the commands and requirements of God. Even God's first command to be fruitful and multiply was an impossibility without both Adam and Eve doing their part. Adam's role wasn't more important than Eve's. Though different, they had equal value and equal importance in that process. So God gave Adam exactly what he needed, an equal partner in every way, a woman created in the image of God, just as he had been created in the image of God. Now I'd like to close my portion of this lesson by sharing a few additional thoughts on this idea of value and importance in the midst of our differences. In Exodus, when God established the nation of Israel, he chose certain tribes or various individuals to act in specific roles. For example, the Levites, they were selected as the priestly tribe, but that didn't make them superior to the other tribes of Israel. The tribe of Judah was selected as the tribe for the future kings of Israel, but that didn't make them superior to the other tribes of Israel. And as we know, in the ministry of Jesus, 12 men were selected to be his apostles, but that didn't mean these 12 men were superior to the other people who weren't selected as apostles. And Jesus often warned those 12 men not to make that very wrong assumption. Now, there's one final thought I'd like to share on this idea of value and importance. As we understand God as a triune God, or in other words, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit working in complete oneness and unity as God, we easily recognize the value and the importance of each role in the Trinity. We even see this in Genesis chapter 1, as God created the heavens and the earth, and the Spirit was hovering over the waters. And later in chapter 1, when God said, let us make mankind in our image, this is likely a reference to Jesus and his active role in the creation. But Jesus was never inferior or less important, and he never hesitated claiming equality with God. Yet God the Son was totally secure in serving in a submissive role to God the Father. 
The simple truth is that men and women are of immense and equal value in the eyes of God. It was that way from the beginning and it remains that way today. Despite how the world may see it or despite how it may be lived out in our world today, this is a foundational truth that must be welcomed by all, believed by all, and lived out by all. Now, I, for one, am, am very, very grateful for the amazing impact women have had in my life and the significant roles they've played. Whether that came from my mother or my older sister or from teachers in my youth or from my wife, Patty, the past 40 years or from my daughter, Brittany, the past 31 years or in one-on-one -on -one conversations I have, I've had with various women or from watching and imitating their examples or from being a part of discipleship groups where I received great insight and advice from women or from hearing their testimonies about how God had worked in their lives, I personally am truly indebted to the wonderful women God has placed in my life. At this point, you may have heard something new from what Kurt has just presented. You heard a new term, a Hebrew term, Ezra Konegdo. You heard Kurt share about differences in ways that we've seen value or, or differences in ways that different communities or different congregations teach about the value. And I'm certainly grateful for the emphasis that Kurt has pulled from the scripture to show that the value comes from the way that God created, not from the worldly mindsets that we bring into the church. Now, I, I think it's important, and maybe it goes without saying for some of us, but the way we read and interpret the Bible has everything to do with our theology and our understanding of God. The ability to differentiate between what God says and what the world says can sometimes be muddy waters for us in our communities. You know, if you're listening to this lesson, you're probably invested enough in your faith to realize that there are a lot of smart people that believe very different things about the same topic. Both ends of the spectrum claim to have an unadulterated and objective view of the Bible. In fact, I've never met anyone that has proudly proclaimed they are not part of a Bible-based church. No one though, none of us are purely objective in the way that we read the scripture. And we have to be able to admit that when we talk about these deep issues. Culture plays a large role in how we read the scripture. Tradition plays a large role. Emotion, sentimentality, bias, status quo, agenda, reactivity, people pleasing, history, scholarship, editing, translation, archeology, span literary analysis, they all play a role too. None of us come to the table, sit down and open up our Bible and have the ability to read it with a pure and unbiased perspective. And as we read and interpret the scriptures and seek to find their meaning and application, we have to be self-aware of this fact. We have to be self-aware that none of us read the scripture with pure objectivity. We all bring ideas to the table with us. And as we mature, we have to learn to admit what those ideas are. We have to share them. We have to say them out loud and guard against those impacting the way that we read the scripture. I've found this in my own life. And I'm also gonna be honest, I'm distrustful of anyone who is unwilling to admit what those biases are. Someone who cannot be self-aware enough to share what they bring to the table when they read the scripture is in a dangerous spot of accidentally or intentionally manipulating what God has to say for us. So the question I want you to reflect upon for a moment is what bias do you read the scripture with? What views do you bring to the table as you seek to understand the word of God? You know, bias is one challenge in understanding the scripture, but there are other challenges, namely how foreign the scripture can be for us, how ancient the writing styles are. They are things that we are not accustomed to. Many of the passages in scripture don't have strong parallels in our contemporary libraries today. Many of the literary styles have shifted and we don't read the same way. We don't write the same way that the Bible was originally communicated. And over the years, scholars have taken many different approaches to understanding the scripture. 
And it seems like every decade or so, there is a new, relevant, in vogue way to read and understand the scripture. These are called criticisms. There's technical criticism, textual criticism, historical, redaction, literary, narrative, archaeological. These are tools through which the scholars read the Bible and try and make it alive and relevant, try and help us to get into the minds of the scripture and the biblical authors. The truth is that the world today is a very different place than the world when Genesis was written. And there's an even larger gap between when Genesis was written and when the actual creation of the world was. Those are two massive gaps that we have to traverse as we seek to understand the significance of the scripture. Genesis 1 through 3 is not a textbook. It does not follow the scientific method, nor is it a notarized census type history. Genesis 1 through 3 is not a recipe either. It's not written with perfect specification so that we might be able to replicate our own world following God's process. Genesis does not tell us about how God created the world, but who the God is that created the world and what is important to him. Kurt spoke about the value in which God sees his creation. There are many attributes about God that are emphasized in the creation account. And Yahweh's prestige and glory are only further highlighted when you compare Yahweh in Genesis to the depiction of other gods in their creation accounts and origin stories. A Hebrew that was listening to this story would have stood in awe at the perfection, grace, majesty, and love that we see depicted in God in this story. And so what we are gonna do this morning is we are simply talking about those principles of God, the God that created the world and the God that put those things into us when we were created in his image. Kurt talked about the value that God places. I'm going to talk about the orderliness with which God created the world. Now, if you compare the creation account in Genesis with any other ancient Near Eastern creation myths, you will find that God, that Yahweh, stands alone in every other one of these creation myths. There is chaos. There is war. There are gods vying for power, trying to usurp each other's throne. There are cosmic battles that go on. And out of those battles, out of that chaos and struggle is where creation emerges. And that's where the mountains are formed and the seas are formed. It's out of this cosmic struggle between gods. If you read the contemporary stories to Genesis, that's what we see. But when you read Genesis 1 through 3, it talks about a God that is perfect. It talks about a God that is loving, that is in control. A God that is not being fought against by other gods. A God that did not have to fight for his place. A God that was not struggling with chaos, but a God that simply tamed the chaos with his mouth. A God that brought order to the world. And a God that had a purpose for his creation. When you read about the creation in Genesis 1 and 2 and 3, you see that God is orderly, that God is intentional. The creation is not an accident of the chaos and struggle. The creation is his pride and joy, and it is very good. Many Hebrew scholars agree upon another literary pattern in which God creates and then orders and separates. Once again, there is an orderliness to God. He creates light, and then he separates it from darkness, giving each their own name. He creates the vault to separate the waters above from the waters below, and he names the vault. The water below is gathered to one place and separated to make distinguishable bodies of land and sea. The lights in the sky are used to separate day from night, and each light is given its own name and its own purpose. Even in creation of vegetation and creatures, the scriptures continue to repeat the phrase, according to its kind, which once again shows God's forethought in order through organization and differentiation. He creates a specific tree and separates that one tree from the others saying, this one you cannot touch and eat from. 
there is an orderliness. There is a differentiation that is found throughout creation. And at no point does this demarcation of creation signify God's preferential treatment towards one part over the other. In fact, it uses the same term, tob, which means good, beautiful, excellent, to describe all of this creation. God creates mankind in Adam, but Adam was alone and God saw that that was not good. Adam could not fulfill the divine mandate on his own. He needed someone else and God created Eve, which in Hebrew means life. Genesis describes Adam as good in the image of God and yet inadequate at the same time. It says that amongst the rest of creation, there was no suitable helper to be found and apparently Adam needed that help. In Genesis 2.18, as Kurt mentioned earlier, we find this term Ezer Kignegdo, which is where we get the term suitable helper. It is not a term of inferiority or subjugation. It is a term of a sign. Helper, not in the sense of an errand boy or an intern that simply fetches coffee for the boss that is higher than him, but a specialist that fulfills a unique task that the other cannot. A specific role or need by design or by circumstance. The role is not based on a worldly application such as a CEO or a national leader, but it applies to God's creation and the purpose that he gives mankind in that mandate. Now later on in this series, one of the teachers is going to teach about 1 Corinthians 11, where Paul draws out this creation order and difference, and, and he talks about it. And we won't go into all of that now, but what we have to remember is that we bring a bias to the table, and we have to understand what that bias is, and we have to, to eliminate it, or try to eliminate it, try and pull back so that we can read the scripture purely. God has a plan. It is beautiful, and it often escapes our understanding and grasp. We have to be okay with that. And just because we don't understand it doesn't mean it wasn't intentional. Doesn't mean there wasn't a purpose behind it. Our inability to understand this does not mean that God made a mistake. That would mean that God's creation could only be as good as our ability to understand it. That would mean that God's purposes can only be as high as our intellect and ability to grasp and comprehend. That would arrogantly make us God. We have to rejoice and celebrate the fact that there are truths of God that we may not ever understand. We get to look forward to those one day when we are with him in eternity. But as of now, there is a humility that is required from us as we sit at his feet. In Psalm 139, the psalmist writes, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is, it is too lofty. I cannot concern myself too much with these things that are greater than me. In Romans 9, Paul borrows the creation motif from Genesis and the prophetic words of Isaiah. And he asks a series of crucial questions. He says, should what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make a sovereign choice about how he forms his clay? We are a creation. And it's this tenuous struggle between us wanting to understand so that we can understand God better and, and digging deeper and asking great questions, but also having the humility to sit back and say, God, there are some things I might not ever know. Let me rejoice in who you are. In Romans 11, 33, Paul interrupts his string of teaching and breaks down to just worship God. In the midst of his teaching, he stops and he says, oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Our inability to completely understand and grasp all the significance of God's design doesn't make his design flawed. In fact, it probably means it's more perfect than anything we could create on our own. It shows the difference between his sovereignty and the worldly wisdom and the baggage that we sometimes bring to the table. I am grateful to worship a God that is a creator, a God that is an architect and a designer and a builder who creates with an order that is far greater than I can understand. So to wrap up our time discussing Genesis chapters one through three, 
I'd like to come back to something that I talked about at the beginning. And I, I think it's a very, very important point for us to consider. Satan and the forces of evil are still very, very active in sowing seeds of discord and lying about the truths of God and lying about the nature of God. Their focus will be to accuse and deceive. They're going to tempt you and I to believe that our value is less than what it really is. Or they're going to tempt us to believe that our value is greater than it really is. We got to fight against those lies. We can't allow Satan to lie to us in that way. We need to respond in the right way to those lies by continuing to rely upon the Word of God and trust His direction on this all important topic. Hi, I'm Jessica Brissage. I serve in the full time ministry with my husband in the Midpoint region. It's so amazing being able to share about generational faith as I sit across from my mom, who's been a faithful disciple for 37 years. So it's really fun as we also get happen to work together in the ministry here in Chicago. I love being here in the Chicago church and serving with you in the ministry here mm -hmm. is like a dream come true. Yeah. Jess, you have always been a very strong, passionate, feisty girl, now woman. And God made you that way. And I love that about you. Um, but I, I'm so grateful that you turned your life over to God and that now you use those strengths to serve Him. Um, it's amazing to watch you being a faithful disciple for now 14 years. That's amazing. Yeah. And now nine of those years you've been in the ministry. When you were in college, I know you led a Bible talk and then you had an opportunity to serve as a campus intern with your ministry mm -hmm. there. And then you went on to um, co-lead some camps in Philadelphia and then here in Chicago. Was it ever a dream of yours to go into the full-time ministry? <laughs> no, uh, no, but I actually, I never dreamt of being in the ministry particularly, but growing up, I was inspired to see um, you and dad's life every day and even when you guys stepped out of the ministry for a time from 2002 to 2014 um, you guys were still helping um, shepherd the region you were a part of and helping out youth and family ministry and we're always in Bible studies and having people in our home so I feel like you guys um, always modeled how to have strong convictions and passion for personal righteousness and loving others regardless of if you were in the full-time ministry or not and really what that showed me it's it's about being disciples all the time mm -hmm. and I think after a few years of being a disciple in college it wasn't until a friend who was a campus intern at the time encouraged me to step into her role after she was going to graduate and I felt really scared and challenged um, to try but I felt like I wanted to to share the knowledge and the wisdom that was poured into me for all my life mm -hmm. to then go and give it to other people. Um, and that route just happened to lead, uh, later to lead me into the full-time ministry with my then boyfriend and now my husband. Um, but some things I've, I've always admired about you are the ways that you're able to connect with people and draw them out. Um, all my friends wanna have their, their time with Stacy, and always, and people feel so loved by you and, and ministered to. Um, I also always appreciated this solid, loving and gracious relationship you had with dad and your, just your friendship and your partnership uh, and your communication um, with each other despite, despite challenges of life and raising kids and a family and your lives were all and are faith-filled and authentic. So, so mom in all your years and experience as a disciple a wife, a mother, and a friend, and a minister, what keeps you inspired to continue living out these roles for God as a woman? Wow, okay. Um, for me, it always comes back to, I think, 2 Corinthians 5, um, for Christ's love compels us. Mm -hmm. And really believing that Jesus died for me, for my sins. Mm -hmm. And because that I'm, I'm convinced of that, it makes me wanna live my entire life for Him in every situation I'm in, every relationship I'm in, any role that I'm in, I wanna live entirely for Him and to honor Him. Um, and I'm also so grateful for the women uh, and the role models that God has put in my life 
to be friends with, to look up yeah. to, and how they live out the scriptures. They can pick me up when I fall down, and they can breathe faith back into me when I get discouraged. And I, I love the relationships we can have in the church and the partnership mm -hmm. that we can have as men and women in the church to help each other grow and not have to be the competition with one right. another. I love that within our generations, we can continue to walk with God powerfully, hand in hand, in His truths, with respect, admiration, and excitement for all the things we will see God do. Hello, my name is Winston Batino. My wife and I have the honor of leading the North Ministry Center of the Chicago Church of Christ. As we continue our day of teaching today, I have the honor of teaching 1 Corinthians 11 and 1 Corinthians 14. As we have already discussed or already mentioned, the ICOC teachers team did a great job putting together the paper entitled Bible and Gender, Roles, Leadership and Ministry. I know they spent countless hours putting it together, so we're very grateful to our teachers team for putting this together. With the limited time that I have today, I won't be able to really cover everything from these two very important passages that talks about the role of women in the church. So I highly recommend that you read the paper from the teacher's team. There are three key passages concerning women's role in the early church, all from the pen of the Apostle Paul. And these passages are 1 Corinthians 11, verses 2 to 16, 1 Corinthians 14, 34 to 35, and 1 Timothy 2, 11 to 14. You know, Scripture does not give us one comprehensive presentation in one unified passage on roles of women. We must survey all the texts that address the subject and receive the truth conveyed by the whole. We must not use one text to the exclusion of others as you will see today as we discuss 1 Corinthians 11 and 1 Corinthians 14. The unity of Scripture has been made possible. If interpreted correctly, Scripture does not contradict itself. So let's dive into it. We're going to be reading 1 Corinthians 11 first. If you have your Bible and you want to follow along, uh, please do so. The letter of 1 Corinthians was sent by Paul and Sustenus to the congregation of believers in the city of Corinth. You know, the church in Corinth was really rocked by division. There was a lot of things happening, a lot of things developing over worldly issues. There were issues of partisanship, with the Corinthians factionalizing behind rival leaders, issues of incest, prostitution, celibacy within marriage, Christian married to one another asking about divorce, Christians married to pagans asking about divorce, questions surrounding marriage and remarriage, lawsuits, there were lawsuits going on, concerns about women praying and prophesying in uh, immodest ways, chaos in worship, issues of speaking in tongues and competing in voices and many more. In short, the church was pretty much a mess. There was a lot of things going on in the church in Corinth. The church had become worldly based and really glory motivated and grounded in immorality. In 1 Corinthians, in chapter 7, in verse 1, the Bible says, Paul says, now for the matters you wrote about. So we know from there that Paul's letter to the church in Corinth is he was answering questions that was posted to him or that was sent to him by the church in Corinth. In our particular passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul addressed the issues surrounding corporate worship, including the Lord's Supper. This is clear when he says in 1 Corinthians 11, in verse 18, the Bible reads, In the first place, I hear, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. The Greek word for church here is ekklesia, which literally means assembly. So when you assemble together, when you come together as a church, there's division among you. 
So Paul is addressing issues that happen when they come together as a church. Issues like head coverings, prophesying and praying. And in chapter 12, he talks about issues with the use of spiritual gifts. And so that's the setting that we have here. They have issues going on in their worship assembly, and they sent letters to Paul asking about these different issues that they have. Let's begin 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 3. But I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dis dishonors her head. It is the same as having her head shaved. For if a woman does not cover her head, she might as well have her hair cut off. But it is a disgrace for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved. Then she should cover her head. Verse 7, a man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image of, and glory of God. But woman is the glory of man. For men did not come from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. It is for this reason that a woman ought to have authority over her head because of the angels. Right away from our readings of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, right away we see here in the church in Corinth that women were praying and prophesying in the corporate worship. You can find that in verse 5. But some of the women participating in the corporate worship did not cover their head. That's the issue that was sent to Paul. And you could find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 in verse 6. Paul exerts the women, encourages the women, basically commends the women in Corinth to cover their heads during corporate worship. Now the question is, why is that? Why is it important for them to cover their heads during corporate worship? We're going to break it down. Let's break it down. First, in verse 3, Paul begins by listing an, or, an, an ordering of relationships with God first, Jesus second, males third, and females fourth. Listen to this. It says, but I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. He states this proposition as though it is understood and accepted by all the disciples in the church in Corinth. Everybody knew what he was talking about. This was not foreign to them. Paul's second argument for women covering their heads while praying and prophesying appeals to the creation order. In verse 7, he says, A man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God. But woman is the glory of man. Verse 8, For men did not come from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. Now, we just learned, we learned from the book of Genesis that both male and female were created in the image of God. The woman was taken from the side of man to be a power equal to. She's power equal to the man since he was lonely without a partner. The argument is founded on created order, not image, since both male and female are created in the image of God. Genesis 1, verse 27. You know, the question that is often asked when it comes to head covering is, is this cultural in nature or is this theological? And I would like to answer that question for you today. You know, what's the basis of Paul's argument when it comes to head coverings? This is theological and not cultural in nature. The theological basis of Paul's argument to describe the relationship of God and Christ, Christ to man and man to woman, is revealed in verse 3. 
Again, I'm going to read it to you. It says, but I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. There he uses the term head, or in Greek, it's called kephali. And the issue really hinges on the definition of the word kephali. There are two arguments for the definition of kephali. One definition, really the more dominant definition, understands kephali or headship as a function of authority. Whereas a small group that believes headship is more related to source of life or origin. So you have one group that believes kephali means authority, while the other believes the meaning of it is source or origin. But when you go back, really a straightforward reading of our text reveals that kephali means authority. Christ does have authority over humans, both males and females, as member of the Godhead or Trinity. When Kephali is understood as head, as head, the pericope is congruent with references to head, hair, and authority regarding both males and females. Some interpreters argue that supporting Kephali as head has led to the subordination of women and diminishment of female personhood, thus negating the identity of women made in the image of God. But headship does not diminish women, but rather describes the heavenly hierarchy described in this passage. Adam was formed first and Eve second, thus creating a natural hierarchy with Adam as head of Eve. So having established the definition of kephali in this text as authority, I want to go back to the question of cultural versus theological. Because going back to verse 3, Paul's point is that the relationship between man and woman corresponds in some way or ways to the relationship between Christ and men and the relationship between God and Christ. Certainly, some things contained in the Bible are cultural. But when Paul explicitly connects the headship of men to the headship of God and the headship of Christ, he makes clear male headship is not subject to change as culture changes. In this sense, Paul is applying a universal principle of headship to a specific cultural issue of head coverings in the Corinthian church. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, in verse 3, it expresses the spiritual reality that women are to express submission to men just as Christ does to God. A specific way this was to be displayed in Corinth was the wearing of head coverings. Paul also ensures this headship not be understood in any authoritarian or dominating sense. Adam needed help, thus woman for man. Chapter 11, verse 9, 1 Corinthians. And woman is not independent of man, or man independent of woman. Chapter 11, in verse 11. In addition, all men owe their existence to women. Chapter 11, in verse 12. So through these words, Paul teaches interdependency and humility and mutuality. Men and women stand in need of each other. In verse 5, But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. It is the same as having her head shaved. For if a woman does not cover her head, she might as well have her hair cut off. But if, it is, but if it is a disgrace for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, then she should cover her head. A man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God. But woman is the glory of man. For man did not come from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, 
but woman for man. You know, females praying and prophesying in the assembly in this, in this passage is assumed, right? The women of Corinth were praying and prophesying in the church. This passage is very clear when it comes to that, that women, and, women were prophesying and praying in the corporate worship in the first century church, in the church in Corinth. The issue of concern is the uncovering of the head. Praying and prophesying are audible acts in the assembly in which women participated. Paul intensifies his argument against the uncovering of the head by the Corinthian women who were praying and prophesying by equating the action to the public shaming of an adulteress by shaving the head. He also presents the argument from nature. He argues we know by nature that what one has on the head can be gender distinguishing. He knew his Corinthian readers would acknowledge that if they woke up one day and all the women were bald and all the men had long hair, something would not be right with the universe. Paul is using that awareness to help his readers recognize that head coverings also can serve as means of distinguishing between women and men. In verses 7 to 8, Paul writes, Man is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. Paul clearly connects the principle of male headship all the way back to creation. That connection rules out the possibility of headship being just a cultural issue of Paul's time that, be, that can be ignored today. At the conclusion of 1 Corinthians 11, 2 to 16, Paul conveys his awareness that some may not agree with his instruction. So he warns against anyone being contentious and affirms his teaching as universal practice for all churches. 1 Corinthians 11 in verse 16. So what does it mean for us? How does this apply to us? If you could hold off a little bit, I'm going to talk about some of the practicals later on after I finish talking about 1 Corinthians 14. We just concluded our lesson in 1 Corinthians 11. Now I want to jump into 1 Corinthians 14 at this point of time. You know, because you read in 1 Corinthians 11 that women in the church were able to pray and prophesy, yet in 1 Corinthians 14, Paul's going to talk to them about being silent in the church. So it sounded like at first there is some discrepancies. There is some disagreement between the two. So what we need to do is we really need to dig in and figure out what Paul is talking about here. So let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, starting in verse 26. What then shall we say, brothers and sisters, when you come together, each of you has a hymn, or a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Everything must be done so that the church may be built up. Verse 27, if anyone speaks in a tongue, two or at the most three should speak, one at a time, and someone must interpret. If there's no interpreter, the speaker should keep quiet in the church and speak to himself and to God. Verse 29, two or three prophets should speak, and the other should weigh carefully what is said. And if a revelation comes to someone who is sitting down, the first speaker should stop. For you can all prophesy in turn, so that everyone may be instructed and encouraged. Verse 32, the spirits of prophets are subject to the control of prophets, for God is not a God of disorder, but of peace, as in all the congregations. Here's our text, verse 34. Women should remain silent in the churches. They're not allowed to speak, but must be in submission, as the law says. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands 
at home. For it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church of the Lord's people. The passage we just read is important for understanding of women's role in the church. The declaration that women are to be silent in the church must be reconciled with instructions for women to sing, pray, and prophesy in the corporate worship. In 1 Corinthians 14, 26-33, Paul silences tongue speakers and prophets with no gender references. In 1 Corinthians 14, in verse 34, he gave instruction to women that are parallel to Paul's instruction to the two other groups. All three sets of instructions, tongue speakers, prophesying, and just women in general in the assembly, uses an imperative form of the same Greek word, sigal, which means be silent. The first occurrence in chapter 14, in verse 28, is employed to command a tongue speaker to be silent when no interpreter is present. The second occurrence in chapter 14 in verse 30 is employed to command a prophet to be silent when another prophet receives a revelation. The third occurrence, chapter 14 in verse 34, is employed to command women to be silent instead of being vocally disruptive. Each of these commands calls upon, upon a different group within the assembly to cease certain types of audible disruptions. Therefore, the instructions in verse, uh, chapter 14, verse 34, do not constitute a universal prohibish, prohibition of women speaking in their worship assembly. Instead, just like the two preceding be silent commands, the command in verse 34 is intended only to call for silence relative to vocal disruptions. Conduct in corporate setting, conduct in corporate worship is a primary concern for the Apostle Paul, including the sharing of the Lord's Supper, including women's role, including proper expression of spiritual gifts, mutual respect, unity, glorification of God. Paul was concerned of orderly way of worshiping God. Tongue speakers are overlapping with one another. Multiple speakers are expressing their gifts of prophecy or the gift of speaking in tongues at the same time, producing confusion in the church. That's verse 29. The interpretation of the tongues does not always occur in verse 13. The service seems to degenerate into chaos with the different gifts being expressed simultaneously. Therefore, the Apostle Paul instructs the Corinthians to impose some organization and structure into their service. Verses 31 to 32. He provides guiding principles for the practice of corporate worship. Guiding principles include the build up and edify the church, plus worship with order and propriety. Paul provides guidance that tongue speakers should be accompanied by interpretation. Tongues are used to witness to unbelievers in reference to speaking the word of God in the language of the unbeliever, while prophecy is for believers. Speaking in a foreign language to people who do not speak that language is fruitless. Without understanding, there is no meaning. Preaching God's word and prophecy convicts listeners of sin through the power of the Holy Spirit. In verse 24, worship is the natural response to revelation. Verses 25, when God is revealed, we prostrate ourselves in reverence and praise. The Word of God judges the secrets of our hearts and produces convictions plus awe of God. The presence of God is recognized through conviction rather than by ecstasy. Verse 26 says, everything must be done so that the church may be built up. 
That's the guiding principle in our worship assembly. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 34, it says, Women should remain silent in the churches. They're not allowed to speak, but must, but must be in submission, as the law says. In verse 34, the verb is a present infinitive tense, meaning to stop continual talk or disruptive speech. The call for silence can refer to literal silence or to be quiet and wait your turn. The instruction follows the theme of the entire chapter to maintain order in the worship assembly. Considering the context of the three uses of the word silence in this chapter, the declaration is not for women to always be silent in the church, but rather at a certain time and certain situation. The other references in the passage call for temporary silence, not ongoing or absolute silence. In summary, Paul corrects three kinds of disorder in 1 Corinthians 14. First, tongue speakers were speaking without interpreters, and they were all speaking at once. Paul wants only two, or at most three, to speak. If there's no interpreter, then the tongue speakers should be silent. Tongue speakers should control themselves. Second, prophets should control themselves and speak in some kind of order. Two or three should speak while the other prophet judge their prophecies. If any prophet receives a revelation, the other should be silent. That's verse 30. And thirdly, women should respect order and not disrupt the assembly. There's a time for silence in the service. Speakers should remain silent while others are speaking. And women are to remain silent if not directed to pray and prophesy. Silence is expected in certain situations, which is referenced in verse 35 here. Women should not act in an improper or disruptive manner. Verse 35 says, if they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home. For it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. This verse refers to the cultural practice for women to remain predominantly in private or to restrict their interaction with men in public. Paul condemns disgraceful speech by women in the fellowship. But interestingly, he does not say sinful speech, but rather a speech that are not appropriate. It definitely was inappropriate in the first century for a woman to correct a man in public. Therefore, if the women were trying to critique the male tongue speakers or the prophets, then their behavior would be considered disgraceful. In public, the custom in the Greco-Roman society was for honorable women to seldom venture out from the private sphere. The virtuous Greek women maintain a propriety of dress and speech in public that followed cultural norms that were established codes of conduct. So women, Paul says, should ask their questions to their husbands at home. The Greek word translated as husbands as, is andras, a word that can mean either men or husbands. However, the two Greek phrase translated here as their own husbands occurs five times in the New Testament where it always refers to a husband or husbands. It should be translated and understood the same way in this context. This reference to their own husbands in verse 35 is most naturally interpreted as an indication that the women Paul is talking about here or he's addressing in 1 Corinthians 14 are all married. We know there were unmarried women in the church in Corinth. If Paul is viewed here to be telling all women to be silent, he's giving only the married ones a means of appropriately seeking the information he indicates it is legitimate for them to seek. They're just not to seek it by asking interrupting questions during the assembly. 
Are we to conclude then that unmarried women had no questions or that Paul wasn't concerned about their questions? Well, absolutely not. In line with the previous two be silent exhortations, it is far more likely Paul is only addressing all or some of the married women because they are the ones guilty of creating vocal disturbances in the worship assembly. Therefore, this command is not addressing all the Christian women in Corinth, but only the married women, or more likely, some group of married women in the church. In light of the context, he does that because only they're creating this order, comparable to the created to the one created by the tongue speakers without interpreters or the prophets who speak simultaneously rather than one at a time. The disorder appears to be the asking of interrupting questions during the assembly. Paul commands them to quit, to stop. Instead, they are to ask their husbands when they get home. So in this verse, Paul is not prohibiting women from ever speaking in the assembly. He is commanding them to quit creating disorder by vocal disruptions. In conclusion, the issue in 1 Corinthians 14 is the misuse of spiritual gifts and the lack of mutual respect for one another. Paul declares the guiding principles of peace and order be practiced in corporate assemblies. Women do not remain absolutely silent on worship, but participate fully, limited only by a call to practice propriety in worship. So what are the applications or changes that we can see in our churches based on this? Well, first, I think it's clear in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, women both prayed and prophesied publicly in church services. That requires that we open the doors to women leading public prayer. In an era where there was no collection of New Testament documents, a primary role of the first century prophet was to speak the words of God. This should open the door to women doing public reading of scripture. Though we continue to view men preaching and teaching in our public meetings, This application of 1 Corinthians 11 could also entail women sharing their thoughts in the context of that sermon or lesson. Women are welcome to share in the context of our public meetings during communion, leading vocals in song, and making announcements without the need for a male counterpart. I hope this helps even just a little bit in explaining the role of women in the first century church, especially in the church in Corinth. I know that I didn't do justice with these two really, really important uh, chapters in 1 Corinthians. I do, again, want to encourage you to study out the paper and read some more so that you could really understand the role of women in the church in Corinth, as well as, as we apply it in our current situation. That's all that I have today. Thank you so much for listening. Have a great day. Hi, my name is Shin Bettino, and uh, my husband and I, we serve in the North Ministry Center in the Chicago Church. And my journey in learning about my role as a woman in God's kingdom began with um, me getting to know God, actually. Um, I grew up in Beijing, China, uh, as an atheist. As a little girl, uh, I had a big dream. I wanted to do great things in life. And in our culture, and women taking charge is being praised, either it's in the marriage setting or the social setting. And that's what I saw in my parents, their, their dynamic in their marriage or, um, or media, you know, everything around me. So that's how I formed uh, my view uh, as a woman. This is how you make it in the world. You got to take charge. And um, as a matter of fact, you know, women don't even change their last names when they get married, um, you know, because we're still in charge. Why should we change our names? And after finishing college in um, Beijing, I came to the U.S. for graduate school uh, to eventually pursue my American dream. 
And that's where I was reached out to and then I studied the Bible. And at the end of my Bible studies, God made it clear to me that the ultimate struggle uh, that I had, it wasn't so much, does God really exist? The ultimate battle was in my heart. Am I willing and able to let go of control of my life and surrender it to a higher being? And among many scriptures, Luke 9, verse 24 and 25 really resonated with me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? No matter how much I was trying to convince myself and others that I've got it all, um, I knew in my heart I was losing it. Anxiety and depression were taking over me because of fear of failure. I feel like God was asking me to give up earning my greatness, but begin to rest in His. That concept sounds great intellectually, but emotionally, I was just terrified. And this language was more like a la uh, foreign language than English to me at the time. After much wrestling and soul searching, I made my decision to make Jesus the Lord on February 23rd, 1996. And that was by far the best decision I've ever made in my life. Even though being a Christian, that journey hasn't been easy, but having that peace and hope that's beyond my life circumstance really uh, is more precious to me than anything I could accomplish in this world. Why do I share about this part of my journey, my conversion, while talking about women's role? Because it set the foundation for me for everything I did thereafter. Whenever my way of thinking or my comfort level conflicts with God's instruction, I've learned to examine my heart. Who's in charge in this moment? Is it me or God? And sometimes God's instruction is clear and I just need to get my heart there. And sometimes it's not so clear. And then I've learned to follow the instruction that I've been given for the sake of unity while continue to search to find the clarity of the scriptures. Since I handed over the reign of my life uh, to the true and only God, God has never ceased to impress Isaiah 55 verse nine in my heart. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Once I finished graduate school, I moved into the vibrant singles ministry in downtown, and we used to call it ABC ministry. I co-led a singles uh, house church with a brother, and we had so much fun, so many great memories were built, and God blessed it in the way beyond anyone could ask for and imagine. And just in the matter of a couple of years, I was asked to oversee the women in three house churches while working in the consulting firm in downtown. And soon after that, um, I, was, I had the honor to go into the full-time ministry. I serve in various capacities and have been part of many campus ministries, both in Chicago and, the, and in the Midwest. Saying that to say, as a single woman, both working in, uh, in the corporate setting uh, and in the full-time ministry, I always felt really valued and empowered. I was able to share my story, my conversion uh, in many settings, uh, small from campus services, large to uh, congregational services uh, with thousands of people. God allowed me to see that my greatness is to proclaim His through my life. But God never ceased to shape and mold our hearts as we journey with Him. So my fear um, was revealed again when I got engaged. Having been a Christian for eight years as a single woman, God has proven to me that I could trust Him. And, and submitting to Him wasn't as hard as the beginning of my journey, but submitting to a man, that was scary. Now, don't get me wrong, I love my husband. There's no one else I would rather spend the rest of my life with other than him. 
But the thought to submit to someone who's as sinful and as limited as I am, it was really terrifying for me. And what if he makes wrong decisions in our lives? Do I have to suffer the consequence with him? And am I going to lose myself, my value, my opinion? And this is where I saw other women, mature women in the church, um, like Trisha Staten, uh, Beth Pachta, Lori Parson, uh, Marcy Arneson, the list goes on and on. And they were strong, secure women, uh, not because of what they were doing in the ministry, but because of their relationship with God. And they were gentle and yet with strong convictions. And they will voice their opinions, they're not afraid of it, yet they're super supportive to whatever the work their husbands were doing. And um, I saw the partnership they had with their husbands and it was worthy of imitation. I was inspired to be like them. Um, having held on to the security God has given me, it's empowered me to not give in to fear, but be what God has called me to be for my husband. As a result, I've been able to, we both have been able to work through many differences that we've had and, and learn to cherish each other's strength and, and learn to be there for each other when one person's weak. We have learned that we're equally loved and valued by God. And Jesus shed the blood for Winston on the cross as much as he did for me. We're simply called to play different roles so that we can function as one. I can't say I've figured it all out, but I do believe that as long as I hold on to the confession I made 25 years ago that Jesus is Lord, He will allow me to rest in His loving arms while taking me on this journey to witness His greatness. And I will be able to continue to make Him known in this world that desperately needs Him. Well, today, uh, Marcy and I uh, drew the short straw and we are covering 1 Timothy chapter 2, 8 through 15. Just kidding, we actually volunteered to uh, teach this section of our day of teaching here. And uh, we just want to say in the beginning here, it's going to be hard to really do justice to unpacking all that we could, uh, all the levels that we'll find in this text today. Again, 1 Timothy 2, 8 through 15 is one of the most complex, debated, and uh, discussed scriptures maybe uh, in the history of Bible and gender roles. But it's important, um, if you could be opening your Bibles there, but it's important at the outset for some special things to be noted or highlighted about this particular set of verses. It's important to know that the, 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 this is set in the context, uh, Paul writing to Timothy, of course, Timothy's the leader of the church in Ephesus, mm -hmm. and uh, it's set in the context of instructions on worship in the ecclesiastical gathering. So when the church gathers in an official uh, sense, Paul is instructing them on how to prepare their hearts to worship God, and also he's addressing some external things, some physical things, some dress code things on how they need to approach God and worship Him appropriately. So we have issues of the heart being addressed, but we also have some directives on just real life application on how to worship God. And so what we're gonna read contains, again, some of the most controversial verses in the Bible. And one of the great challenges of these verses lies in determining what is occasional, in other words, uh, what did Paul write, meaning it was only for those folks at that time in that church, what is occasional uh, or specific to address in their culture, and what is universal? What did Paul write that he believed applied to Christianity through all of time? And I'm sure you're hearing this in all of the different sections being taught today, but we're going to have to unpack what is occasional versus what is universal. So let's, let's just jump into the text here, and we're going to take it piece by piece, and we'll begin by reading verses 8 through 10, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. The Bible says this, I want men everywhere to lift up holy hands in prayer without anger or disputing. I also want women to dress modestly with decency and propriety, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. 
I think it's very important. I think Marcy and I have talked a lot about this, but the first thing to note is Paul is not just giving instructions to women here, although that tends to be the focal point of, of this particular uh, uh, part of the Bible, but, but Paul is giving instructions to men and to women. As a matter of fact, if you go back to the beginning of chapter two, where he starts giving instructions on worship, he's, he's uh, addressing everybody collectively in the church, and now he gets into specifics about men and about women. So we've got instructions for men to lift up holy hands, or maybe as the Jewish brethren at that time would say, clean hands, as they would wash their hands before they would lift them as holy hands before the Lord. But you know, he's instructing the men that you've got to come to the Lord in worship with clean hands and a clean heart. You've got to rid yourself of anger and conflicts that are arising in disputes with your own brothers and sisters in Christ. And I think we would all say, yes, you have to be intentional in that. And certainly uh, that was something Paul needed to address with the brothers in the church in Ephesus. And then next, Paul moves into addressing the sisters, the women in the church. We have instructions of modesty for the women, how you beautify yourselves, how to dress, the kind of jewelry, he mentions pearls and gold, types of clothing, expensive clothing, how to style your hair. Paul specifically mentions braided hair. So he goes into a, a really detailed list of what he's seeing the sisters, how they're presenting themselves, or maybe how culture is presenting uh, values for women. And he's saying, this is not how you present yourself modestly in a worship environment. Mm -hmm. Paul uses words like propriety which means to uphold acceptable standards and or morals. I mean, as Christians, we always wanna claim the high ground when it comes to purity mm -hmm. or morality. Yeah. He uses a word, he says decency. You know, Christians want to present themselves in decency before God, respectable, mm -hmm. proper moral standing as we present ourselves in worship and honor and praise of God. I think the idea here is we don't come to church to show off ourselves, mm -hmm but we come to church to honor God. We show off God. We lift up God, we don't lift up ourselves. You know, Paul seems to be identifying behaviors common among the men and then those common among the women that Timothy is leading. I think on this front, most scholars agree that these were specific struggles Paul is addressing and these commands are occasional when he gets into the details of what he's talking about. We would identify these commands today in the Chicago church as occasional while also carrying universal principles that we should consider in the ways we worship here in the Chicago church. We can apply some things universally from this to how we worship God today. Is it required that men only pray with their hands lifted in the air? I think we would all say, no, that's not exactly what Paul is saying. But universally we would say that men should come to church having a righteousness, having a confession of sin in their lives, having a sense of accountability that I come before God with a pure and clean heart. We can't lift up holy hands while having anger and conflict with our brothers and sisters reside in our hearts. We'd say, yeah, that's true today, but we don't have to physically lift our hands to pray, but universally we know having a right heart is important. Likewise, we believe that these beauty or adornment instructions are occasional and not universal. In today's world, a sister can braid her hair. I don't know how to braid hair, but I know Marcy does. And it, it's not scandalous if she comes to church with braided hair. And the same goes for jewelry or clothing. And the universal principle in this modesty-specific directive yeah. would be but would be the very first phrase that Paul says here, I also want women to dress modestly. Modesty is universal in its application to Christianity over all time, but we do believe the specifics of what Paul's saying were occasional to what was happening in Ephesus. This is really important to talk about you know, understanding what is universal and what was cultural for that day is something scholars have been discussing for centuries. It is especially important that we take time to learn from God's Word and not be quick to just dismiss any part of God's Word saying, well, that was for back then. <laughs> it's not relevant today. Scholars suggest reading scriptures with a clean slate as much as possible without our own personal bias and cultural influences affecting our interpretation. 
However, it is also important to not have a spirit that says, let's just deconstruct everything and start over. We do not want to tear apart all the good that has been built. And what is that good? Well, it's the universal part of this passage where genuine ornamentation is a matter of the heart. Yeah. The way that we present ourselves should be a reflection of the heart that demonstrates our love for God and others. Although Paul discussed dress, his true emphasis was not merely that women should dress modestly, but that genuine ornamentation is not external at all and consists of an attitude of commitment to good works. In every culture, disciples are to dress in a way that allows the inner beauty of their heart to demonstrate to the world that they love God and live their lives to His glory. What we take away is our modesty as Christian women should exceed even the expectations of our culture. Amen. You know, Marcy and I have a lot of notes on this and uh, maybe in the future we can, we can unpack this even more. I think, I think it's important to know that the culture was creeping in and influencing the church in powerful ways and Paul is pushing back against it. You know, there are possible in, uh, cultural influences here because of the nature of the city of Ephesus. You know, Timothy, whom Paul is addressing here in this letter, was a younger evangelist. We know he's leading the church in Ephesus. That's uh, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. But this is important information because Ephesus was culturally a cutting edge city of its day. It would be like walking into modern day Manhattan or LA or downtown Chicago, Paris, London, Tokyo, you name the modern city of our age and that's what it was like to walk into Ephesus. Mm -hmm. You know, Marcy and I had the privilege a couple of years ago yeah. of walking into the archeological dig in the ruins of, of Ephesus and you are immediately blown away at how modern the city appears even today in its ruined archeological state. The underground clay pipe plumbing system. Uh, I mean, that was just revolutionary for its time. The granite streets are still flat and usable. You can walk into the amphitheater in Ephesus and it literally today could seat thousands of people and you can stand without any audio equipment and speak from the stage and you can be heard through the whole amphitheater. I mean, it is an incredible city for its time. But most of us know from Acts 19 that deeply entrenched in the culture of Ephesus was the worship of the fertility goddess Artemis. Of course, there's a riot that breaks out in Acts chapter 19. And so deeply entrenched in the history and in the influence of the citizens of Ephesus would have been this sense of you must worship Artemis because she provides the food that comes on our table and the fruitfulness of plants. And when you have a baby, Artemis is the one that protects the mother and the baby from dying in childbirth. Mm -hmm. Artemis was worshiped and statues were put in people's homes. And there are many who speculate that not only was the goddess Artemis deeply influencing the culture, this female goddess, but also the Roman culture and the emergence of what's called the new Roman woman mm -hmm. was starting to influence how women thought in the culture in Ephesus, mm -hmm. including how some of our Christian sisters of that day believed a woman should conduct herself. The new Roman woman was an emboldened sexual feminine revolution of that day. Mm -hmm. Now, it is debatable, if you go and study the new Roman woman, it's debatable as to how much influence that new Roman woman had on what Paul's writing here. But many do believe that this concept was affecting women and energizing them in a direction away from more conservative cultural norms, including Christian conservative cultural norms of their day. And so women began to present themselves in ways physically and sexually and in leadership roles and using their voices and perspectives to be heard in the society of their day. Historical study seems to show that it began with the wealthy Roman women coming into the city, kind of like a Hollywood scene, if you will. And then their trends and their way of thinking began to seep into every facet of the society, especially in the city of Ephesus. And so it was affecting marriages. It was affecting men's and women's roles. And it was starting to maybe creep into the church. And so this kind of sets the stage on why Paul is giving such specific directives that we've already discussed are occasional. Mm -hmm. But we move into something that appears to be more universal as we read verses 11 through 15. So let's read this together. 
Paul goes on, he says in verse 11, a woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She must be silent. Mm -hmm. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness. And here's that word again, with propriety. You know, Marcy and I read this and we thought, yeah, there's really nothing we can expound on here. I think we just pray and end the lesson right there. <laughs> just kidding. You could spend days unpacking uh, the influence of this passage and how we should interpret it. But let me, before we dive into these specific verses, let's just, let's just hit a couple of highlights that mm -hmm. I think are important. We've talked a lot about this, that connect what Paul is teaching here to other passages in the Bible that might provide some guidance for us. Mm -hmm. The first thing is this, women can be teachers, okay? We know this because Paul teaches in Titus, when he writes to Titus in chapter mm -hmm. two, mm -hmm. verses three through five, that older women are instructed to t teach the younger women, which is a very strong t tradition being practiced in our church today. Mm. Paul also says in 2 Timothy 1, 5, that women are to raise their children up in the faith, just as Timothy was with his own mother and his grandmother, that women teach their children faithfulness through the scriptures. Mm. In Acts 18, we see a husband and wife pair up. Uh, who co-taught co together. Of course, Priscilla and Aquila, they're teaching Apollos. They go into the home and they teach Apollos the more adequate way of the gospel. So we know women can be teachers. Secondly, women prayed in mixed audiences. And just a couple of examples is uh, post-resurrection, before Pentecost in Acts chapter one, uh, the, the brothers and sisters gather in the upper room and they're praying for the Holy Spirit to give them the power they need to do what God will call them to do. In Acts chapter four, the believer's prayer where the room, they're gathered men and women and they're praying together and the room is shaken by the Holy Spirit. Men and women praying together in an ecclesiastical setting. In Acts chapter 12, James has been put to death by the sword. Peter's in prison and uh, they're gathering at Mary, son of um, uh, the mother of John Mark. They're gathering at Mary's home and, uh, and of course they're praying, God, please open the door and spare our brother's lives. Yeah. So we know that women can be teachers, women can pray in mixed audience, and women prophesied and spoke the word of God truthfully. Luke 2, verse 36 through 38, Anna was a prophetess who proclaimed the word of God. Acts 21, 9, Philip's daughters prophesied and proclaimed the word of God. In many, many other examples in scripture, women are hosting, participating, serving, worshiping, influencing, and partnering with their brothers and with each other in Christ to proclaim the gospel message. Mm -hmm. And so just a minute, Marcy's gonna share, but let's look at this verse 11 again, where the Bible says, a woman should learn in quietness mm -hmm. and full submission. This word quietness is an interesting word. Hisakia is the Greek word. A woman should learn quietly. This is the same word used again right down in verse 12, but this time in verse 12, it's translated as silent. Hisakia is translated quietly in one place and silent in the other. Mm -hmm. If you go back to chapter two, uh, verse, uh, verse two of chapter two, Paul says we should strive to be, live peaceful and quiet lives. It's the same word. So it's being translated as quiet. Many of us know, and this will be taught in another section of our teaching in 1 Peter 3, 4, Paul, or, uh, Peter talks about the unfading beauty of a woman who demonstrates a quiet and gentle spirit. And so that word, hesekia, appears in 1 Peter also. And I think we should, we should uh, uh, unpack this just a moment. What is Paul saying to women about quietness and full submission? Well, quietness here in 1 Timothy, hesekia, compared to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, 33 through 34, where he says this, as in all the congregations of the saints, women should remain silent in the church. When Paul writes to the church in Corinth, he's not using hesokia, he's using a Greek word, sigatosin, which means to be silent or remain concealed. So he's saying something different in 1 Timothy than he's saying to the church in Corinth. Mm -hmm. 
And I think, and we think, collectively we think, that within the context of the ecclesiastical worship and instruction, Paul is instructing women to learn quietly, hey, Sakia, and submissively to their male leaders. It seems Paul is working to keep women learning in a posture of submissiveness and without being boisterous, disruptive, or taking control of the learning environment. Mm. I love this. I love that Paul is telling the women that they should learn. We have to remember that this was not the norm for the women at that time. I can imagine the excitement the women had as they knew that they were going to be trained in the understanding of the scriptures. This isn't a perfect analogy, but imagine you have a child who's getting ready to go to school for the first time, and you were gonna prepare your child how to learn. We had to do that. We've done that. Don't run around in circles at your desk. You know, don't interrupt when someone else is talking. Um, you know, if you have a question, raise your hand. Yep. Um, you, need to be, you need to be quiet, sit and listen. Um, to the teacher. You know, this is the posture for learning. And this was very empowering time for the women in the church. Yeah. But they needed to learn the scriptures correctly. Quietness and submission are a matter of the heart. Paul wanted to make sure that the conditions of the assembly were conducive to learning, so the women would have an opportunity to learn. This was a progressive thought in Paul's day. Paul says, let the women learn in quietness and submission. This is the way men should learn as well. Anyone who is teachable should have a quiet and submissive heart. This allows the heart to be teachable. Clearly in our society today, of course, women have degrees, advanced degrees, and education of all types. It is important for us as women to also be learning the Word of God, learning it and maturing in our faith. We should learn with this posture so that we can teach the Word of God correctly. Amen. I, I love if we could draw a DNA, a spiritual DNA strand from the moment the sisters started coming into the, to, to the ecclesiastical learning environment. Mm -hmm. And they're sitting there learning the Word of God for the first time. Men and women sitting in equal attentiveness to the Word of God mm -hmm. and they're learning. And Christianity was developing that rapport. And so, you know, if you're a sister out there with a PhD today, it began with women sitting in the teaching environment. That's great. Uh, mm -hmm. because Jesus influenced us in that direction. Yeah. I love that idea. Let's jump into verse 12. Um, and again, these uh, are very complex and hotly debated uh, passages. I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She must be silent. Now imagine one of our evangelists preaching that on a Sunday and just letting it sit right there. You know, again, it should be stated that Paul cannot mean a woman should never teach because that would contradict what he said in other places. And it means that we should read this not as two commands or two directives, but we should read it as one. Paul's not saying, I do not permit a woman to teach and I do not permit her to have authority over a man. He's saying, I do not permit a woman to teach and have authority over a man or to have authority over a man. So he's saying there's an authority issue going on here that we've got to take a look at, okay? Mm -hmm. We have to recognize here that as Timothy read this letter, as he got it in his hand, the parchment was unscrolled or however it, was, it manifests itself in, in front of Timothy's eyes, Timothy would have read this to mean a woman should not be in a position to teach or have authority over men in the ecclesiastical or church assembly. That's how Timothy would have read it. The question for us today is, what is the universal nature of this versus the occasional nature of this? The Greek word here for authority is authenteo. We've talked a lot about this. Mm -hmm. This word has generated debate and controversy, I'm not kidding you, for a thousand years. This is the only appearance of authenteo mm -hmm. in the scriptures. It's even rarely used in the Greek secular lit literature of that time. Some translate this not just as mere authority, but as a domineering or commanding or of a grabbing authority type. Kind of a disruptive, conflictive, uh, a, a, a conflict for authority in a certain situation. Mm -hmm. And so one view is that Paul is trying to prevent women from taking control or taking over mm -hmm. and causing disruption in the worship services. Even going back to the earlier verses in chapter 2, Paul is continually calling the church to be quiet, 
to be a place of peace, to be a place of reverence to the honor and glory of God, a sense of calmness. So anything that looked like a grab for authority would create an environment the opposite of propriety, the opposite of decency, the opposite of respect and submission and the quietness that Paul kind of thematically continues to mention in this letter. So some speculate that in a culture like Ephesus with the new Roman woman and the the backdrop of the worship of a goddess like Artemis, a female goddess like Artemis, that relationships between the men and women in the culture were conflicted and tense and confusing as to how to properly and respectfully uh, work together, including in their worship of Jesus Christ. So we can imagine that, I think, in our world today. We, as a Chicago church leadership, and really across our entire global fellowship, have come to believe this passage is connected to other passages related to headship or authority when it comes to men and women, men's and women's roles. We do not want to overread a cultural context into this passage and lose the universal meaning that Paul is striving for. And again, this has been hotly contested and debated for hundreds of years. But we take the view that there is an occasional influence for why Paul directs what he does here. However, there is also a universal teaching here regarding headship and a delineation of roles between men and women in an ecclesiastical setting. Mm -hmm. And I think this universal delineation, this universal context of this passage is supported in the next reference that we're going to read here in verses 13 and 14, where Paul now calls up the Genesis account of Adam and Eve. And he says here, For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not the one deceived, it was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. Now, again, this is very, uh, from, our, from our ears, it probably comes across as very hard language uh, in 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 some way but Mm. some again believe the backdrop is entrenched in all the history we've talked about so far many of the converts may have been many of them women may have been priestesses serving at the altar of this fertility goddess combine this with the new roman woman and this culture just seems ripe for for a kind of a conflict between men and women as they came into christian fellowship Let's talk about universal versus occasional Mm. as we kind of come to a close on the teaching aspect of this. And then we'll hit some practical applications and close out this section of the day. Mm. As we read these passages, here's what we have concluded from a universal versus an occasional uh, uh, perspective. The specific issues regarding the directives on modesty and the lifting of holy hands we believe are occasional while the need for modesty and the need for a pure heart in worship to God is universal. In our interpretation, it is universal that our ecclesiastical learning environment should carry a priority of proper decorum and demeanor, this sense of quietness and reverence that Paul's talking about. This includes the call for us all to carry a humble spirit of quietness and submission, men and women alike but also that the women should conduct themselves under the authority of the male leadership in the congregation. It also includes that no woman or man should be fighting for authority or control in an environment of worship, but we view ourselves in different roles, but in equal partnership to honor God. It is our interpretation that these passages, that Paul, in these passages, Paul establishes universally that men and women have different roles and offices of authority in the ministry. We also believe that we must be careful to create an environment of worship and learning in our presentation that respects the headship of Christ and the ecclesiastical authority of those who lead us spiritually. As mentioned earlier, opportunities have to be created for women to teach in areas of expertise and passion. I can't think of a time ever in the ministry where Marcy asked to, to weigh in or ask to mm-hmm. contribute. We've taught so many times. I've never, I can't think of a time where I've said, no, that doesn't work. We always try to partner together and she respects my authority as a spiritual man. We want women to share in communion messages, participate in sermon points, help foster an inspiring worship environment, pray in the assembly and participate in the reading of God's word as we see throughout the scriptures. And we believe Paul was clear to Timothy that all of this should take place in an environment of humility, 
respect, and recognizing that Paul is clear to Timothy that women should not exercise authority, authenteo, over their brothers in Christ. Lastly, and this is for another time, Paul writes, but women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. Yeah. I think with the cult of Artemis in the background, probably the clearest explanation to me of this particular passage <laughs> is that women felt like by letting go of, of the influence of Artemis, they were somehow embracing a more dangerous course through childbearing or their children or something like that. There was some remnant of that. And I think Paul is saying, you know, trust God. God will protect you. Get rid of this false idol, this false worship of a false God. And with these ideas around the new Roman woman, my, women might have been rejecting some traditional roles and, and, and downplaying the role of a mother, downplaying the role of a wife. And I think Paul is just accentuating here that it's a beautiful thing that God has created and we should trust God and surrender ourselves into his loving, safe arms. Amen. Amen. You know, I am challenged and grateful for all that we are called to be as God's daughters. Yep. You know, um, I love that we are encouraged to use our gifts to build up God's body, His church. And we have opportunities all around us to impact those, um, whether it's teaching, singing, serving, encouraging, praying, being hospitable, etc. You know, and it seems important that we don't look at a passage like this and focus on the one thing that I can't do. Wouldn't that be similar to when God said, you can eat from any tree in the garden, just not from the tree of life? Could we see in this passage a protection that God gives to both men and women in their distinct roles as they serve in the church? Yeah. It's good to remember that scriptures are not written to withhold good from us, but to protect us from harm. As women of God, we have a high calling as we walk through this life. A calling that I hope you and I fulfill as we grow to be more and more like Jesus Christ. You know, let's continue to pray and think of these types of things as we, as we close with some practical applications for the Chicago Church of Christ family. You know, we talked about our guidelines, and I appreciate what Marcy's sharing here. We love our partnership in the gospel. We love our spiritual family here in Chicago. And... Uh, we're excited because I think there's, we're stating things that we're beginning to practice that are very practical in nature as we learn from scriptures like the one we studied today. Where do we land, practically, where do we land in regard to women's ecclesiastical or in the church leadership roles? Here's what we feel like is outside of our boundaries or our guidelines. We do not feel that women should be appointed to the roles of lead evangelist, elder, or church leader. As is our practice, women will continue to serve in very uh, functional levels on staff and contribute at the highest levels of our leadership groups and church boards. What do we define as an ecclesiastical setting or the setting of the corporate worship? We define that as any authorized meeting of the church called by the leadership that would fit into the category of Sunday worship, midweek services, or house churches in our small group gatherings. How do we view women teaching to a mixed audience in a non-ecclesiastical setting? For instance, if a sister has, a, has an expertise in some area that we want to teach in the church, be it counseling or financial or related to mental health, our view is that men and women alike can both instruct and teach in these settings based on that area of expertise, giftedness, or passion, and can utilize their insights on scripture freely. One idea that was highlighted here was that women should be trained to avoid inappropriate, often authoritative, urging, rebuking, or commanding in a mixed audience. When a woman speaks in ecclesiastical setting or corporate worship, does she share her thoughts versus teaching scripture? In an ecclesiastical setting, she can feel free to share her insights on different verses. We see this as distinct from teaching, commanding, urging, and preaching, which is the responsibility we see in a passage like this given to the male leaders. In a regard to a mixed gender small group Bible study or house church, how do we view a sister facilitating a Bible talk discussion? Or maybe as a helper to the male if he's not trained or quite equipped yet to handle something like that alone. And so we need more clarity regarding the difference between leadership and facilitation. But the general thought is if a brother is there and can lead, he should do it in an extreme case, a sister, or, or in, a, in a necessary case, I should say, an exceptional case, a sister obviously can uh, uh, provide the, the guidance that's needed for the group. 
And lastly, in regard to worship, the general sense is that it is not inappropriate for sisters to stand up and lead our congregations in worship. And we have sisters in Chicago that do such a wonderful job. But again, it should be trained in regard to tone and demeanor and not grabbing the reins of control or authority over the congregation, but rather lifting their gifted voices before the Lord and honoring God. And we love how that unfolds in the Chicago church. And so these are just some of the practicals that we feel like we wanted to highlight in light of 1 Timothy chapter 2. We hope this has been helpful today. Thanks so much for participating and weighing in. We love you guys. Hello, everyone. My name is Clint Lahr. My wife, Christy, and I, we lead the Midpoint Ministry Center here in the Chicago Church of Christ. And for this session, we're going to be reading Galatians 3, verses 26 through 29. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn there. Of particular interest is going to be verse 28, because that's where it mentions male and female and talks about that relationship in Christ. But let's go ahead by reading the passage. In Galatians 3, it says in verse 26, So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Like I said, verse 28 is going to be of particular interest for us in this session. And it has a long and varied history of interpretation. There are some who said that Galatians 3.28 is the most important scripture on equality in all the Bible. There are others who said that it's actually talking about an obliteration of genders, that God is now making this androgynous being in Christ. There's others who have said that it's uh, demolishing marriage and procreation roles. And so if you're hearing these things and you're thinking, what in the world is all that about? And what is it actually saying? That's what we're going to get to the bottom of in our time in this session. I'm assuming most of you have done this exercise or played this game where you see an extreme close-up of a picture and you try to guess what the picture is. And usually that first extreme close-up, you only see uh, you know, a couple pixels perhaps. And at that point, I mean, it can be almost anything that you can imagine. But the more it pans out, little by little, you get more of an idea of what it could be. And obviously it gets easier to tell what the picture is the more it pans out and more the picture you can see. There's something similar that happens when we read scripture and study scripture. If we just zero in on Galatians 3.28, we can make it say almost anything we want. Uh, as I gave some examples just a second ago. But what we're going to do is we want to pan out and see what's the bigger context that this passage is sitting in to help us understand the, not only the bigger picture, but get us more equipped to understand what Paul is talking about. So let's start with Galatians as a whole, the book of Galatians and what's going on there. We call it the book of Galatians, but originally it was a letter from the Apostle Paul to the churches in Galatia, which he helped establish on his missionary journeys. And if you read through uh, the letter to the Galatians, it's very easy to tell that this is a fiery, impassioned letter. Paul's tone is strong and forceful throughout. And you go, okay, what's got Paul so fired up? Well, he says in chapter 1, verse 6 and 7, that the Galatian churches are turning away from the gospel. Something, turning towards something that he says is really no gospel at all. And as you read through, you find there are some people who have been influencing the church to continue with some Jewish practices. They'll say, yes, we need Christ. Yes, we need Jesus. But if you're going to be truly righteous and a part of the people of God, not only do you need the Christ, but you also need to keep observing some of these things from the law. You need to keep uh, practicing things like circumcision. And Paul says in Galatians 3, he goes, who has bewitched you? He says in chapter 5, they are hindering you from obeying the truth. Paul vehemently rails against this teaching. He says, if you say you need Christ 
and you still need to obey the law, you're diminishing the supremacy of Christ. You're diminishing what he has accomplished for us. And so he says, no, all you need to be a part of the people of God, to be righteous in God's sight, is to be in Christ. And in the middle of this letter where he's making that grand point, we find Galatians 3, verse 26 through 29, which speaks very powerfully, as we'll see in just a moment, to what it means to be a part of the people and family of God. So that's the bird's eye view of Galatians. That's the big point and the big issue that's being addressed. Let's zoom in a little closer and find out what's going on before Galatians 3, 26 through 29 and what's going on after because that's going to help our understanding as well. Let's start with what's happening before. Let's read in Galatians 3 in verse 19. It reads, Why then was the law given at all? It was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. The law was given through angels and entrusted to a mediator. A mediator, however, implies more than one party, but God is one. Is the law therefore opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. But scripture has locked up everything under the control of sin so that what was promised being given through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. Now that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. Have you guys ever bought something that you had to assemble. You know, you bring it home, you get all the parts out, you look at the instructions, you assemble it, and then when it's all put together, you have some pieces left over. That's a bit of a, a you know, scary moment. You go, did I, what steps did I miss? Did I do something wrong? Perhaps you try to pacify yourself and say, no, these are just, these are the leftovers they put in there in case, you know, you, you lose some pieces or something like that. You know, I was just talking about Paul's main argument in Galatians is that to be in Christ is all you need to be a part of the people of God. It's not in Christ and observing the law, it's in Christ. And so this leads to some questions of, so what about the law? Like, is the law one of those leftover pieces? Why the law? What's the role of the law? Paul says in verse 24 that the law was like a guardian. The Greek word there is pedagogos, which it's where we get our English word for pedagogue. Now, when we say pedagogue, we mean something like a teacher. But back in Paul's day, it meant something more like an attendant or a custodian. Not a custodian that cleans facilities, but like cares for something or someone. Uh, it was used in some ancient writings to speak of a person that would accompany a young child to school to make sure they got there safely, and then they would superintend their behavior there at school. You could maybe perhaps think of some modern day parallels, it might be a, a, a crossing guard at a school or a school bus driver. Like their responsibility is to get the children from one place to another safely. But when those children grow up, ideally, they, they don't need those anymore. They don't need a crossing guard to get across the street safely. They don't need someone to help them get from point A to point B. Likewise, Paul is saying the law brought the people of God from one place to another in their understanding of God, in their relationship with God. But now that Christ has come, he's brought us to a maturity where the law is no longer needed for salvation. Now, let me clarify something here. Paul is not anti-law. He's not anti-Torah. I would think he would say there is so much to be gained uh, from reading and practicing the Torah. I do not believe Paul would say to the Jewish Christians in Galatia that they need to give up their Jewishness. Uh, nor do I think that we should read this passage and think that, oh, well, I guess we don't need to read or learn about the Old Testament. That would be, I think, a, a, a grave mistake. But what Paul is saying is that observing the law through things like circumcision, um, dietary restrictions, celebrating certain holidays, that those things are not a requirement 
for inclusion into the people of God. Only being a part of Christ is what is required. So that's a little bit of what's happening before our main passage. Let's jump to what's happening after our main passage. Galatians 4, verse 1. What I'm saying is that as long as an heir is underage, he's no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. The heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also, when we were underage, we were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. The spirit who calls out Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. There's some continuation from what we read in chapter 3, verses 19 through 25. It talks about coming of age. It speaks of a guardian. Here Paul uses the illustration of a a father who perhaps has passed away and he has a child who is still a minor. And as such, that child kind of has the same kind of access to the inherited possessions as a slave might. But the father sets a certain time for that child to become a fully entitled heir to the inheritance that is due him. And what's cool is this is how God treats us. When we were slaves, He went about making sure we became sons and daughters, that we got to share in the inheritance that he offers. Because Paul is really addressing the question in chapter 4, verse 1 through 7, how do I become a fully entitled child of God? It says, well, it happened when God appointed a time for his son to come, be born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem us. So he's, again, making the same point that to become a child of God, it happens through the Son. It happens through the Spirit. This is by God's hand. It only happens in Christ, not through observing a specific Torah commands or rituals. Okay, so we've got the overview of Galatians. We've got a little bit of an understanding of what's happening before our main passage, what's happening after our main passage. We're much better equipped to find out what is Paul talking about in chapter 3, verses 26 through 29, and specifically in verse 28. So let's jump to verse 26. It says, So in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. Some people say this is pretty much the thesis statement, the, the summary statement for all of Galatians, for Paul's argument in his letter to the Galatian churches. He's saying, You are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And he goes on to say in verse 27, For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. This is a continuation of this idea of of being uh, a child of God through Jesus by faith. And he, he then talks about, after talking about by faith, he talks about baptism and clothing ourselves with Christ. Now, Recently, you know, over the last hundred or so years, there's been a lot of talk about faith and baptism. And that conversation is usually framed where those two things are separate. Faith is one thing. Baptism is another thing. But that simply isn't the biblical picture. In his landmark study on baptism, G.R. Beasley Murray, who is a, a Baptist scholar, states this. He says, God's gracious giving to faith belongs in the context of baptism. Even as God's gracious giving in baptism is to faith. You might go, well, what does that mean? He's saying there's not this dichotomy between faith and baptism. They belong to each other. Wherever the Bible says this is what happens because of faith, this is what happens to your relationship with God because of faith, there are other passages that say this is That same thing happens in baptism, you know, and vice versa. They're not separate. They go hand in hand. And Galatians 3, 26 and 27 is a great example of this, right? We are children of God through faith, for we've been baptized into Christ and clothed ourselves with Christ. You might go, wait, so are we children of God through faith or through baptism? 
And the answer, I believe, is yes. They go together. Uh, they, they're not to be separated. But then he goes on, and verse 28 is where we really want to give our attention. He says in verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. All right, in this verse, Paul uses three pairings. He talks about Jew and Gentile, slave and free, male and female. Now, talking about Jew and Gentile makes good sense, given the overview of what the issue is that Paul's addressing in the letter to the Galatian churches, right? They are, there's divisions that are happening among ethnic cultural divides here. Uh, the, the, the Jews are saying to the Gentiles, you need to become more like us. And that's happening to a degree that you read in chapter 2, that even Peter is giving into that, uh, the apostle Peter. So that makes good sense that, that Paul would include that pairing of Jew and Gentile. But then he includes uh, slave and free. And when you read Galatians, Paul doesn't really address any issues going on in the churches between those who are slaves and between those who are free. Male and female, he doesn't really bring up any issues in the churches in Galatia that are going on between the men and the women. So why are those pairings included? I think a good solution is because he's trying to emphatically make the point that we are all one in Christ. Jew and Gentile is his main concern in the letter to the Galatians. And, and so he's saying, yeah, it doesn't matter Jew or Gentile, we are one through Christ. But to just drive his point home, he's saying, he's covering all this basis. Jew, Gentile, slave free, man, woman, it doesn't matter. We get to all be one in Christ. But this brings up the question of what does it mean to be one in Christ? I think verse 26 is really instructive for us in understanding that. You see in verse 28, it says, for you are all one. In verse 26, you are all children. But it has these, both have these phrases, you are all. And then both have the phrase, in Christ Jesus. You see that in verse 26 and verse 28. So really the only difference is you are all children of God or you are all one. So what does he mean when he says you are all one? I think he's restating the similar idea and concept he was stating in verse 26. He's saying Jew, Gentile, uh, slave free, man or woman, we all get to be children of God. We all get to be united as one in Christ. Now, Earlier I stated that there are some scholars who read an androgynous interpretation into this text. I think that's a completely wrong interpretation. I do not think that this verse is saying that we lose our gender or our ethnicity when we're baptized into Christ. Because unity does not mean uniformity. But I do believe verse 28 here is teaching a powerful message that shows that in Christ, these divisive forces that threaten our world are overcome by a, a, a Christ-centered unity. Then it says in verse 29, If you belong to Christ, you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. This picks up on a point Paul started in chapter 3 and verse 7, uh, where Christ is now Abraham's seed. So if you're in Christ you get to be an heir along with Abraham's seed. That is Jesus, the Christ. And so we get to partake in the inheritance of the promise that was made to him. So you might be thinking, okay, so how does, how does all this stuff contribute to our conversation today about gender roles and the Bible? I, I believe Galatians is an important letter, an important piece of God's revelation to us. Paul was addressing a situation where the truth of the gospel was being twisted and distorted and abandoned and using ethnic markers uh, to, as a source for their division. And Paul was adamant that the thing that brings us together isn't observing the law, it's being in Christ and having a oneness 
in Christ. It's interesting that elsewhere, Paul uses the two pairing, two of the three pairings we just read from verse 28. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul talks about baptism again, and then he uses these two pairings, which is, which is interesting. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, he says, For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body. So there's this idea of baptism, this idea of oneness. And he goes, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free. We were all given the one spirit to drink. He mentions two of these same pairings that we read in Galatians 3.28. Well, what does that have to do with all of this? I think his point in 1 Corinthians 12 is, even though we may be different and we have different roles and different responsibilities, different gifts, different backgrounds, we all get to be united in Christ and we bring those things to the table to serve the, church, the greater church. I think he's making a similar point in Galatians 3, where it's really about unity. It's really that, hey, no matter where you come from, we get to be united in Christ. Yes, we might end up having different roles. We might have different responsibilities, but Christ is the unifying factor. I think to read any extra direction about gender roles in the church from Galatians 3:28 would be probably extrapolating too much from what the text itself says. There are other texts that speak far more directly to the role of women in the church. And a lot of those passages are being addressed in the workshop today. But Galatians 3, verses 26 through 29, it's a powerful reminder on what unites us as a church family. All are welcome into the family of Christ. May we, as God's children, fight to protect that unity and grow in our love and unity with one another. Amen. Hello, I'm Christy Lahr, and I work alongside my husband um, at the Midpoint Ministry Center of the Chicago Church of Christ. And I love the point that Clint made, that in Christ, the divisive forces that threaten our world are overcome by a Christ-centered unity. You know, there are so many divisive forces in our world, and I love that the answer to combating them is Christ-centered unity. The theme of unity is huge throughout the New Testament. It was so important to Jesus that it was a main part of his last prayer before he went to the cross. In John 17, he prayed that we would be one just as he and the Father are one. Now that is a powerful type of unity. You know, Paul even upholds unity as utmost importance throughout all his letters in the New Testament. You know, in Ephesians 3.10, he says that through the unity of the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known. There's passages like Clint talked about in 1 Corinthians 12 that talk about the oneness of the body, yet the different functions of the body. And like Clint said, Unity does not mean uniformity, but even here in verse 25, it talks about that there should be no division in the body. There's no place for division in unity. We can and we should bring our unique gifts and talents as children of God to help build unity in the body. You know, seeing this passage in Galatians 3 from a woman's perspective, I'm so grateful to be part of a kingdom, a church, a body of Christ, where I am valued and needed. I feel humbled to be able to sit in a position of leadership within the church and very, very blessed for the unity within those groups. Although there may be many perspectives and voices, we all strive for unity following the Spirit's lead. You know, our flawed humanity sometimes fails in unity by creating divisions and ranking those divisions. But God's plan for his people is complete unity where all parts are important and valued and honored. Like I shared earlier, Seeing the unity in the leadership of my parents growing up, seeing them lead together and side by side, 
seen women as a highly valued part of the body made a great impact on me growing up. I have been blessed now to be part of a leadership dynamic in which I feel that my voice is truly valued and heard. And I am grateful that in the church, we can try to uphold a unity that is talked about in Galatians 3, where the world may set out to divide and place value, we can hold on to our true value as children of God. And hopefully we can see each other in that way as well. As a woman, it draws me closer to Jesus to see how his interactions with women, uh, like his interaction with the Samaritan woman in John 4, exemplify this unity and value. Although there are still differences, our unity can connect us in ways that are truly powerful. Well, hello everyone. We are Reuben and Barbara Marbury, and we serve in the ministry here in the city ministry of the Chicago Church of Christ. And we also are a part of the eldership team. As a part of this event, we'll be summarizing some thoughts from Colossians 3 and Ephesians 5. In Colossians chapter 3, verses 18 and 19, it says, Wives, <coughs> submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. In Ephesians 5, verses 21 through 33, Scripture says, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also <laughs> wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does for the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself and the wife must respect her husband. You know, the verses that we're gonna be looking at in Ephesians and Colossians, they focus on household codes that apply primarily to the dynamics within Christian families. You know, Paul is not addressing what happens in public worship. Instead, he's speaking directly to the relationship between married couples. In Colossians 3, verses 18 and 19, Paul's giving very specific direction to the wife and the husband. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 21 through 33, Paul says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then he proceeds to give specific additional direction to the wife and husband. You know, so since much of the direction in Colossians chapter 3 verses 18 and 19 is repeated in Ephesians chapter 5 verses 21 through 23, we are going to focus today on Ephesians chapter 5. Now we understand that Paul was not writing in some cultural vacuum. Right? We know that Paul was not uh, married himself, but he had examples of marriages in society that he could easily reference. And he saw what the dynamics were like in those marriages. The cultural uh, dynamics of family life in Ephesus and Colossae would have been quite similar. And while we can't completely reconstruct what marriages was, were like in that culture, we can see that Paul does not write and instruct the disciples to follow the culture around them. Instead, Paul highlights Jesus Christ through the entire discourse of Ephesians chapter 5, verses 21 
through 33. For example, in, in verse 21, he says, we are to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. This reverence for Christ can be both our motivation and what empowers us to submit to one another. A side note that is worth mentioning here is that the word submission has been saddled with many different connotations today. There are those who hear submission and other things come to mind, such as abuse or devaluing the person who's doing the submitting, a lack of choice and other such thoughts. The pure denotation of the word submit is to yield to the authority of another. That authority could be a superior at work, a trainer at the gym, a nutritionist, even ourselves at times. The act of submission, the act of yielding can be difficult, especially when the one to whom we are submitting does not clearly understand their role. It helps me to keep in mind that Christ submitted to God for our salvation. And Christ did so because of the intimate relationship he had with God. He knew God's love for him and could see the larger picture. And when you look further into the passage, one of the things that we see is we see that the standards for husband loving their wives is as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for the church. You see that in verse 25. When husbands are directed to love their wives as they love their own bodies, the example that Paul uses is how Christ cares for the church in verse 29. And we're reminded that in verse 30, we are members of his body. You know, even when Paul talks about the man leaving uh, his father and mother and being united with his wife, he says, this is a profound mystery. And then he goes on to say, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. The focus on Christ is so important. The scriptures that we're highlighting in, first, in Colossians chapter 3 and Ephesians chapter 5 speak to headship, submission, and gender roles. These are not occasional concepts, but they are universal concepts. It's these three areas, headship, submission, and gender roles that are the ones that typically bring up any kind of tension, concern, and frustration when we consider these passages. You know, Paul's clear in his statement that the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. You know, literally this means that the husband is the head or top of the wife. But the Bible then goes on to say that as the church submits to Christ, wives should submit to their husbands in everything. You know, if we have to keep in mind that all that Paul says about Christ in this passage should help mitigate any frustration. Think about the environment that the husband creates when he loves his wife as Christ loves the church. When you consider this context, right, when you look at the context of how Christ showed love for the church and gave himself up for her, that headship is not abusive and it's not selfish. Christ is the head of the church as one who cares for the church, not as one who lords over the church. The Bible doesn't hide the fact that this is a statement of leadership and authority. Organized systems do exist within the family system and structure is definitely needed. Hierarchy can be beneficial or it can be detrimental. Christ serves as the head of the church and his legacy is one who came as a servant, not as one who came to be served. And so let me repeat this for emphasis and clarity. Christ serves as the head of the church and his legacy is one who came as a servant, not one to be served. The authority of Jesus is never separated from his servant example. Husbands who love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for the church are following a powerful example of love and integrity, compassion, selflessness, and wisdom. And Paul makes it clear in verse 21 that the submission that he's talking about is expected of all followers of Christ to one another. 
but this command works in conjunction with the roles and expectations that God establishes in the marriage and family structure. It's important to note that submission isn't a statement of one, one person's value over another. When we're called to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, it's not founded on the idea that one of us is more valued than the other. In the same way, when the wife is called to submit to her husband, in no way is the husband more valued than the wife. Each role is valued. Following the direction in these passages does not allow for oppression, selfishness, or control. There's no sinful abuse and authority in the example of Christ. Submission is not a burden in that paradigm, but instead it's a partnership where everyone benefits both husband and wife. Again, the tone is set in verse 21, which implores us to submit to one another. The one who submits does so out of reverence for Christ. The reverence for Christ provides the foundation for the willingness of both parties. Paul sets that willing submission in the context of general relationships and then in the context of the love between husband and wife. You know, personally, I've actually seen these passages to be very true in our marriage. Barbara and I celebrated our 30th anniversary this year uh, by the grace of God. And, and I realized that none of the direction in these passages in Ephesians chapter 5, none of that comes naturally to me. But I'm so grateful for God's direction and for Christ's example. You know, when I truly seek to follow Christ's example in how he loved the church and gave himself up for the church, when I seek to imitate that in my own marriage, there isn't any room for the kind of oppressive and domineering behavior that would make Barbara frustrated with my leadership role. That leadership that the church follows under Christ is sacrificial and servant leadership. And the leadership that I am supposed to provide for Barbara as her husband is sacrificial and servant leadership. You know, when I really work to take care of her as Christ uh, takes care of the church, she doesn't feel neglected. She doesn't feel unloved or unappreciated. She feels served and sacrificed for. It's when I get away from Christ's example that I start mishandling my authority. When I step away from Christ's example, my natural character becomes a stumbling block that causes tension in those areas of headship, submission, and roles. And that's where I can become self-focused, inconsiderate, and proud. And what I found is that seeking to get back to Christ's example reestablishes the proper execution of Christ's commands. And again, what we've said about Christ, my authority and example go hand in hand. I can hold my position of leadership and still create a partnership where Barbara and I have equal input and we work together for the benefit of our marriage. You know, it's easy to submit when we're on the same team, when I have a voice on the team, when I'm valued on the team. A leadership that hears me is one that I'm both happy and eager to respect and support. But it's really a back and forth relationship dynamic. As Reuben shared, playing his role may not come naturally. It can be the same for me and is something I've worked on over our 30 years of marriage. I have to ask myself in different situations, am I giving my husband respect and supporting his role as the leader? Am I trusting his love and care for me? As I work to respect Reuben's place in our marriage, it serves as a blessing for both of us. I wanna be sure not to get my definitions of submission and respect from the world. Worldly connotations of both words can often include abuse and an absence of value and care. In Christ, there's no need to be vying for power. And that's so true. And each of these commands, right, the husbands, the command that husbands love and care for your wives and wives respecting your husbands and submitting to them, those commands benefit the other spouse. 
The wife benefits when the husband loves and cares for her, and the husband benefits when the wife respects him and submits to him. When both husband and wife play the roles that God has given them, no one has to do without the benefits that they receive from the other spouse. No one can provide these benefits in the same way. And so when we hear and we follow these passages, the way that the author here outlines and presents these issues of submission, respect, care, love, hierarchy and structure don't become the focus. The relationship becomes the focus. And we get a powerful cycle of mutual blessing that gains momentum in the marriage. Thanks so much for taking the time to listen. We hope that we have shared things that bring glory to God and honor Him, and we hope that it's edifying to everyone who hears. Amen. Amen. Hello, my name is Sharice Montgomery, and I'm a part of the Southland region of the Chicago Church. I've been a disciple for 31 years, and I'm humbled and honored to share my thoughts and experiences about God's sanctifying work in my heart concerning this important topic. I grew up in an environment where certain siblings were unadulterately favored over others. I was not favored among the ones, and I felt like I had to compete with my brothers and sisters to win the love and attention I desired. As I grew older, I began playing sports and quickly realized that I was quite good. My achievements as an athlete won the respect and attention I desperately wanted. I remember the adulation I received when I became the first girl in the history of my elementary school to make the boys basketball team. Not only did I play, but I landed one of the coveted starting positions. It was during this time that I developed the conviction that my status as a winner was the key to success. Soon after, it didn't matter what I did or what I was involved with, my attitude was the same. I had to be the first or the best. My esteem and self-worth depended on it. I carried out this mindset into the kingdom when I became a Christian in 1990. I was barely out of the waters of baptism when I set my ambitions on going into the full-time ministry. I dreamed of being the first single women's ministry leader in Chicago, and I went about it the only way I knew how, with a competitive spirit and an excessive preoccupation on my goal. God graciously allowed me to serve in the ministry for nearly 10 years, but not as a single women's ministry leader. He had a different plan for me. During that time, he began to expose and change my heart using his word and the example of the bold yet loving sisters who were faithfully serving God and others. These were powerful, strong, faithful, courageous, and gifted leaders and laywomen from diverse backgrounds and various marital statuses who embraced their God-giving role and they powerfully were advancing the women's ministry across the church. These women strove to be completely unified with God and their fellow brothers and sisters in the body. As a result, God did amazing things through the example of their lives. I'd never experienced such a profound sisterhood among women in my life, and it changed me. Philippians 2 verses 3 through 8 teaches, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Paul vividly reminded the Philippians of how Jesus did this. Jesus' ambition was rooted in his love for God and the world. His desire was to advance the kingdom, not himself. Jesus did not empty himself of his deity or equality with God. Astoundingly, he forsook some of the rights and privileges of his deity to become a man. And not just any man, he took on the role of a servant. Jesus knew God was fully good and fully trusted his good plan. He embraced his role as the suffering servant in complete unity with God, even during the challenging times in the Garden of Gethsemane when his role was nearly too challenging to bear. In complete humility, Jesus valued and served me above himself by dying a shameful death on a cursed cross. 
In 1 Peter 2, 21, it teaches that Jesus set an example for me to follow. And according to Philippians 2, 5, I'm called to have the same mindset of Christ in my relationship with brothers and sisters. As I put to death selfish ambitions, worldly mindsets and tendencies to compete, I was free to have a greater concern for the interests and needs of others. And I began serving with the heart of Jesus. Today, I continue to trust God's plan for me as I strive to live out my role as a woman in His kingdom. The world believes that greatness is achieved mainly through selfishly asserting one's will, convictions, and ambitions. Paradoxically, Jesus teaches the greatest in the kingdom is a servant. I've learned that joy is found through humble faith in the saving work of Jesus, joining myself in complete unity with my brothers and sisters, and serving God and others in the name of Christ for His glory, not my own. Hello brothers and sisters, my name is Ian Peel and together with my lovely wife Rebecca, we both serve and lead the South End Ministry Center in the Chicago Church. Now the passage of scripture that we're going to be covering to further our study on the Bible and gender is going to be coming out of the book of Titus in chapter 2. We're going to be covering verses 3 through 5 and in these few verses we'll see that Paul is instructing Titus to teach the older women in the church in Crete regarding their role in helping the younger women to mature in love and holiness. You know, when I was going through graduate studies at Harding School of Theology, I was often reminded that a helpful tool for interpreting passages in the Bible is to consider the broader context. Consider the broader context in which a specific passage is placed. And so particularly, to consider the historical, the cultural, and the literary context of any given passage when we strive for interpretation. And so for our purposes, we know that Paul is talking to Titus. And he's giving Titus instructions on how the disciples ought to live there on the island of Crete. Now, as some of us may know, Crete had a bad reputation for its people being wild. And the Cretans were belligerent and immoral and self-indulgent. Actually, Paul went even as far as to quote one of Crete's own philosophers in his letter to Titus saying this, the Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, and lazy gluttons. Crete was also made a Roman province in 71 BC, and its legal code that the people live by, well, it provided women with freedoms and rights that were not enjoyed by the rest of the women in the Greek and Roman world. And so at the beginning of Paul's letter to Titus, in chapter 1 and verse 5, Paul says this. He says, Titus, the reason I left you in Crete was so that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. And so the urgency in which Paul instructs Titus, it seems to indicate the belief that the need for shepherding in Crete was certainly pressing. As the B&G paper states on page 91, this could reflect that an inappropriate behavior among the younger and possibly older women was already occurring in Crete and Paul was simply reacting to the situation. And so the verses of scripture that are under examination here in verses three through five, what they do is they also fit into a larger literary context in Titus chapter two. It fits in verses one through 10. And the first 10 verses in Titus two, they serve as a form of household code that specifies behavior that is appropriate in God's household. Such codes can also be found in New Testament passages, such as in Colossians 3 and Ephesians chapter 5. And believe it or not, these household codes, they were also common within Roman culture at large. In almost every culture, the home is the foundation of every society. And in the verses that we are giving our attention to, Paul is writing what the way of life in the family ought to look like, not only in the Christian home, but in God's household at large, specifically for the women. And so this brings us to our text in Titus chapter 2 and verses 3 through 5, and let's read together. This is the NIV. It reads as follows. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, 
to be busy at home, to be kind, and to be subject to their husbands so that no one will malign the word of God. And so like I already stated, Paul is instructing Titus to teach the older women in the church in Crete regarding their role in helping the younger women to mature in love and holiness. And so also, Paul wants the disciples in Crete, he wants them to reject the negative characterization that's spoken of the people on that island, and rather he wants the disciples to live a life worthy of the calling they have received from Christ. And so Paul urges this form of household cult teaching. Why? Verse 5 says, so that no one will malign the word of God. This appears to be part of the intent behind Paul's instruction. Paul was attempting to ensure that the older women and the younger women, as well as the older men and the younger men, that they all behaved in a manner that made the gospel attractive and also facilitated the church's growth. And so the heart behind Paul's words, his words appear to be protective in nature. And he also desires for the disciples in all different seasons of life, he desires for the disciples to collectively make the gospel appealing. As the B&G paper states on pages 90 and 91, Paul's concern was that the women, both older and younger, that they not bring shame upon the church by acting in a way that was culturally inappropriate, since outsiders would assume that inappropriate behavior was approved by the church. And so, although we're only unpacking a few short verses in this segment here, there is much that we learn and can apply to our current home and church practice. Number one, Paul's letter to Titus, it clearly presumes a church missing situation in which opponents and false teachers are present. Now, as we know, false teaching is dangerous, and of course, we need to be on guard against it. But importantly here, the need for shepherding in the church is always imperative. Number two, the second thing we learn from these short few verses is that within the spiritual community, the older women are to teach the younger women with a focus on spiritual formation. Spiritually mature women should be empowered and encouraged to teach the other women regarding parenting and marriage, as well as spiritually mature women should teach other women how to overcome sin, remain pure, and how to become self-controlled. A third point of learning and a third point of application appoints us to the Christian marriage relationship. This is when Paul directs the older women to be subject or submissive to their husbands. Now, there's not enough information present in this context of passage to determine whether the nature of the wife's submission to the husband is culture-bound or transcultural. So what we do is we look to other places in Paul's writings in the other household codes in Ephesians 5 and Colossians 3 to get our proof where it's clear that the wife's submission to her husband, it's to be willing and voluntary in nature. And as we know, this same spirit of willing and voluntary submission, this should be exemplified by all disciples of Jesus Christ. And finally, we learn in these short few verses, we ought to optimize women teaching women. And we should optimize women's congregational sharing opportunities so that our congregational persona it accu accurately represents our respect of the women's role in the church. And so the Bible and Gender paper, it supports our current philosophy of ministry with the employment of women's leaders by giving women an important role in the spiritual, spiritual training of other women, along with providing women with key seats at the decision-making table. And so at this time, my wife, Rebecca, she's honored to share some of her experiences with all of us from her time in the church. Hello, I'm Rebecca Peel, and I serve as the Women's Ministry Leader in the South End Ministry Center. I want to take you guys back with me to a prayer that I prayed in late 2008 when I was really seeking God with all of my heart. Um, prior to this prayer, I had been uh, living a, or trying to live a Christian life, um, but I was doing it all on my own. And honestly, it was an emotional roller coaster. One day I would feel close to God and everything in my life would be great. A few days later, I would feel his, his absence and be devastated and just be so eager for the next spiritual uh, experience to allow me to feel him again. 
I was constantly tossed back and forth by any and every good sounding teaching and I relied heavily on my ever changing emotions to provide me with spiritual security. When really what it caused was a deep insecurity in my relationship with God. What was the truth about him? What did it really look like to live a Christian lifestyle? Hitting this wall led me to this prayer where I just said, God, I don't care if I have to convert to another religion. I just want to know who you are and I need Christian friends. <laughs> God answered that prayer in the most incredible way. A lady I worked with at the YMCA named Ivy was someone truly special. She was older than me, not old enough to be my mom, but not young enough to be my peer. She was more like a cool aunt. We had only had one interaction in passing, but honestly, it was impactful for me. Ivy was different. I was a complete stranger to her, and yet she shared her life so vulnerably with me that I felt like I was her best friend. I felt like she held very little back, and she was so transparent and real with me, it was a little unusual. And what's crazy is I don't remember her sharing anything spiritual with me. She never invited me out to church or to a Bible talk, but she did share her faith with me through sharing her life. We became friends on Facebook, and it was there that I learned a little bit more about her faith. I sent her a direct message asking if we could meet over coffee because I just felt so lost, and for some reason, I trusted her to guide me. We got together and the first thing she did was open up the scriptures with me. And she began to teach me the very things that my soul was so desperate for, but I didn't really know I was missing. She took me out to TJ Maxx the week before Christmas and she taught me how to have a very natural conversation about God with other people. She introduced me to the campus ministry in Milwaukee where I met some of the most amazing down-to-earth um, people and where I met some of my best friends. She taught me indirectly about marriage and about parenting just through me observing her and watching her. She invited me to the Milwaukee Church of Christ, which was unlike any church I had been to before. And in February of 2009, she helped baptize me. God changed my life forever through Ivy. An unlikely friend, but one God used to save my soul, and ultimately, the woman who gave me the opportunity to enter into the full-time ministry alongside her and her husband, Damon. A year after I went into the ministry, Ivy and I did a lesson together and wrote an article in Disciples Today about our relationship being like that of Ruth and Naomi. Because honestly, it really did feel that way. Ivy was my Naomi and I was her Ruth. And like Ruth told Naomi in Ruth 1, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Ruth's heart was to have an unwavering loyalty to Naomi. And why? What kind of woman must Naomi have been for this young Gentile woman to really give up everything to be with her? She must have been pretty remarkable. And it's amazing to see how God blessed both Ruth and Naomi's life through their relationship. This story became a sort of theme for my relationship with Ivy. My God was no longer my emotions and myself. It was the God Ivy taught me about in the scriptures and through her life. Her people became my people. And when her and Damon moved to Springfield, Illinois to lead the church and invited me to join, I followed. And I believe God has blessed both Ivy's life and certainly mine through this relationship. It is such a special gift to have a relationship uh, with Ivy that I do, and I deeply treasure it in my heart. When I think about Titus 2, 3 through 5, the scripture that we've been talking about, about older women living this exemplary life and then teaching the younger women, I think about my relationship with Ivy and the countless number of women who have taught me the good way in every area of my life. Ivy's example helps me um, know God, help me have a re reconciled relationship with God. But I can think of time and time again where I was led to God because of another sister's example and their teaching. It is truly one of the greatest blessings about living this Christian life. 
For the older women, what an honor and a privilege to be used by God in this way, to help spiritually nourish, nourish us younger sisters. You have wisdom and life experience that we don't have yet. And I hope and pray that you feel empowered by God to pursue us and share your lives with us. The victories and the mistakes, because we really do need you. And for the younger women, one day we're going to become those older women. And just like they are a product of the women who've poured into them, we too are gonna to be a product of all that's been poured into us. And this too is such an honor. I hope and pray that we can have the humility to see our need to be students of these Titus II women and not be afraid to reach out to them. You know, I have two daughters, Willow and Hope, and I believe they're going to need other spiritual women in addition to myself who will love them and teach them this good way. I believe these godly influences have shown them and will continue to show them what real true Christianity is and what a rich life with Jesus looks like. I'm so grateful for all of these honorary spiritual grandmas and aunties, and I'm so grateful for God's plan to use mature Christian women to pass on their faith and wisdom to the next generation. Thank you. We're wrapping things up here. This is our last teaching segment today in our day of teaching. I am Maurice Charles, and my wife and I have been part of the Chicago Church for 13 years now, and we're part of the staff that leads uh, in the city ministry. And so we hope that uh, you feel taught today, instructed in God's word. And it's our hope that this last segment will be instructive and thought provoking in your walk with God and in your study of the topics that we've covered today. You know, I've noticed that a tendency exists on all levels of society, whether it's in the home or at the workplace, in social settings, or when it comes to national and global politics, even in the church. There's this tendency to force things into dichotomies when they don't need to be. It is possible to like both Pepsi and Coke. It is possible, however controversial it may be, to be a fan of both the White Sox and the Cubs. It is possible to like both chocolate and vanilla. And it's possible to be an original trilogy Star Wars fan while also having an appreciation for the films that came after. We don't have to fit into the boxes that are formed by division with everything that we encounter. The scriptures ought not be read from an either or point of view. No idea in scripture should be used to negate another, but instead scriptures should be used in harmony to bring clarity to the whole. It seems that we tend to read things and understand things from the vantage point of extremes because we want to find the nice and comfortable, sort of tidy, safe, and absolutely right place to stand on something. But not only is it possible to avoid all extremes and hold on to two seemingly opposite ideas at the same time, there's even instruction to do so in Ecclesiastes chapter 7. When ideas are paired together or juxtaposed one against the other, it's important to know that doesn't mean that we need to choose one over the other. We don't have to fall into that trap. For instance, when Paul says physical training is of some value, but godliness has value in all things, that doesn't mean that we need to choose one over the other. He's not saying that we should ignore physical training because of its limited value. He is saying physical training is of value. It has less value and less application than godliness, but it is still of some value. $20 is of some value, and just because you have 100 more doesn't mean you're going to throw away the 20. Physical training is of some value. True. Godliness is of even greater value. Also true. Both statements are true, and both provide opportunities for conviction and direction to be applied to our lives as disciples of Jesus and students of God's word. This tendency to divide and quarrel is addressed a number of times in Paul's letters, and his instruction is simply this. Stop quarreling. It is a sign of worldliness, and it, he warns people against doing so because it only ruins those who listen. Instead of quarreling, we should, as the Proverbs tell us, seek understanding. I'm going to read from 1 Peter chapter 3, 
And the reason that I've spent time talking about logic is because this passage is full of amazing insight about God and about his value system. And it's also full of solid instruction for disciples. But much quarreling is produced from this passage for the very reasons I outlined previously. Many have read one part of this passage to the exclusion of the other. And it's, it's created some extreme misunderstanding and misapplication. So here we are reading in 1 Peter chapter 3, reading verses 1 through 7. It says this, Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the, the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives, when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. Your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to adorn themselves. They submitted themselves to their own husbands, like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her Lord. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. You know, if the passage ended in verse 6, it would seem quite lopsided as it would have only addressed Christian wives, but it doesn't. It contains a complimentary idea addressed also to Christian husbands. In line with the examples of logic I was giving earlier, I want to make sure to mention that this passage isn't saying that women should not adorn themselves outwardly. It's not saying that outward adornment is bad. It says that outward adornment is not where beauty is derived in the eyes of God. While people may look at the outward appearance, God looks at the heart, the inner life, the character are the high marks of beauty in God's eyes. Okay, so within the backdrop of living in such a way as to win over unbelievers, there is this call for wives to submit themselves to their husband, that the husband might be won over when they see the content of their wife's character. Throughout this letter, Peter gave various calls of submission to the scattered people of God. Earlier on, he mentions that we should submit to the governing authorities. He says slaves should submit to masters. He says wives should be in submission to their husbands. And he even says young men ought to submit to those who are older. Each of these calls to submission are steeped in a glorious purpose. They, are, they aren't simply here to give order to society or provide structures for subjugation and subordination. It says clearly that the point of this willful submission is to bring about God's purpose in their lives and the lives of those around them. If there's something disdainful to you about this sort of submission, you need to recalibrate. Consider what example or whose example of submission is playing in your mind? I have no doubt that we've all seen horrible examples of what submission looks like when it's forced or when it's demanded. Some of us have seen and even experienced horrible things in the name of submission. But remember, the example that this instruction is based on is the example of Jesus Christ himself, who entrusted himself to God in life and in death. The Hebrews writer tells us that during the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Submission is not a, a rule to be obeyed or a mandate to be wielded as a whip to subdue other people. Submission is an attitude and lifestyle to be chosen by the one submitting. This was an extreme idea in the first century and it remains so now. Historically, way back when, wives and slaves and young people had little to no rights. So submission, submission was a frightening idea. In contemporary times, in our context, there's a philosophy in the world that says, I'm the captain of my own ship. So the idea of submission in our day is repulsive. 
both then and now, the idea of voluntarily submitting your own will to that of another, it's radical. But again and again, Peter lays out God's expectation of submission because it's indicative of submission, not only to man or someone who's above you, but ultimately submission toward God. The instruction doesn't end there. Remember, we need to read the whole passage and bring it into harmony, not use one part to our perceived benefit. There is a short and simple instruction given to the husband. It says, husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life. And then there's a warning. It says, so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Did you hear what it said at the beginning? It says, in the same way. It's not as if the instruction being given was one-sided, and it isn't one-sided at all. Peter says, in the same way. He's saying to the, the men listening to this letter, everything I just said to your wives, married brothers, I hope you were listening because it applies to you too. And he draws out the application of the same principle for the married men. He says, be considerate. Treat your wives with respect as the generally physically weaker partner. Be someone to whom your spouse would gladly submit themselves, gladly entrust themselves because you are a reflection of God's character. There's nothing about this passage that suggests women are spiritually weaker or slower or behind men. That idea doesn't match up with the statement that Peter says here, we are co-heirs of the gracious gift of life. My wife, Sissy, is going to elaborate on these ideas and speak from her study and experience with these ideas expressed in this passage. Hi, I'm Sissy Charles. I work alongside Maurice in the city ministry. When I reflect on this passage and my experiences, I feel a great freedom and am given a divine confidence in my value. To know in God's eyes my beauty is based on my character, not on the ever-changing climate of fashion, belongings, and style of body that's popular. Not bangs or no bangs, not side part versus middle part, not skinny jeans versus mom jeans, not the bushy eyebrows versus the thin. Instead, my value does not come from the outward adornment. Rather, it should be that of my inner self the unfading be beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. It's interesting how that phrase can trigger some. Some may hear this and feel they have no voice or personality when following Christ. However, I'd like to point out this phrase is talking about my inner self, not an outer action, but my spirit. This makes me think of Jesus before Pilate in Matthew 27, verse 13. Pilate asked him, Don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. In context, Pilate is trying to determine what to do with Jesus. Jesus had every opportunity to prove who he was, but instead, he chose not to. In that moment, Jesus was choosing to willingly submit to God's plan, though it meant pain, suffering, and death to come. He still chose it. Jesus chose to look to his spirit, a spirit filled with reverence, gentleness, and even peace with what was about to happen to him. And even in the midst of an intense and challenging situation. When I think about that, I see this being the same character I'm called to have. I want to adorn my inner self with a gentle and quiet spirit. That doesn't mean I have no voice. That doesn't mean I can't have my own personality or feelings. But that I actually can present my inner self as someone who's strong, reverent, and full of absolute trust in God's plan. This is a true and everlasting beauty that not even time can take away from me. Hi, I'm Akasia Ramirez. Hi, I'm Lexi Vadami, and we serve in the North Ministry Center. Ephesians 2, 19 through 22 reads, 
Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Just by looking at this scripture and realizing that we're no longer foreigners and strangers to God is unbelievable. We were both graciously added to God's kingdom, myself back in 2015 and Acacia in 2019. Not only were we added into God's household, but we are now citizens with God's people. This means that we're called to live in a way worthy of such a calling. That means serving like Jesus did, loving like he did, and most importantly, sacrificing like he did. As young women in the church, God has entrusted us with his people. For me, that means humbly co-leading the teen ministry in the North, and for Acacia, humbly co-leading the campus ministry. This means teaching a younger generation what it means to no longer be foreigners and strangers. But this also means we are learning right alongside them. We need just as much guidance as the guidance we're trying to give. We are so beyond grateful for the foundation that has been laid before us, starting with Jesus as the perfect cornerstone and the apostles and prophets following suit, as well as all the members of God's household. For us, these are our parents, mentors, leaders, and anyone else who has taken the time to pass down their wisdom. Again, we are still learning. This is the beauty of the body of Christ. We are now trying to give back what we ourselves have been given. However, we do not mean this solely in terms of leadership. We mean this in terms of living out the discipleship that God has called us to as citizens in God's kingdom. Yeah, I mean, neither of us were planning on being in positions of leadership. For myself, the first time that leadership was ever mentioned to me, I was a freshman in um, college, and I remember thinking, what? Uh, I don't know about that. So I asked Stacey Fridley, who was discipling me at the time, what she thought about that. And she was like, you know, I had thought of that for you. Um, but let me ask you first, do you plan on being a disciple your whole life? And I was like, well, yeah, of course I do. And she says, well, then learn everything you can, not for leadership, but for discipleship. If you lead one day, amen. But if you don't, you're always called to discipleship. For me, that made it clear that my goal is not to be in ministry or leadership, though we would love to continue in our roles. The goal is to glorify God and serve His people. Yeah, being in ministry was never a part of my plan either. Before being a part of the ICOC, I was a part of an environment where women, especially younger women like myself, weren't allowed to be a part of any sort of meeting and we were discouraged to even voice our opinions. We weren't supported or lifted up for our many efforts. Instead, many doors were actually slammed in our face. Even so, I praise God every day for graciously taking me out of that environment and placing me in the environment that I'm in now. The Chicago Church welcomes me into every staff meeting with open arms. I am encouraged to share my thoughts and opinions. It might take me a little more courage <laughs> to do so, but I know as soon as I do, I am not deemed any less worthy. Being a woman in leadership is not about being submitted to man. It is about being submitted to God. It is about having a heart posture of both gratitude and servitude and about saying yes to the call. As young women, we go into the world and we can feel unsafe, belittled, and torn down. But we really mean it when we say there is nowhere we feel more safe than in our church and our leadership. We feel uplifted, respected, and so we thank you for allowing us to be a generation that has been poured into, some since even birth, and we're beyond grateful for that. Although we are so young, we can still start pouring into those younger than us in the ways that any of you have poured into us. We can start by blessing others in the way that God has blessed us. Thank you for giving us an opportunity to share today and for allowing us to be young women leaders that we are. What an honor this is. You know, thank you for any of you that believed in little girls like us and have loved us and taught us so that now we can do the same for other little girls. Thank you.
Hello, Chicago. I'm Darren Goche. This is my lovely daughter, Camille. And uh, wow, we just heard a lot today. Uh, my gratitude is to all of the teachers around the globe that spent hours and hours, men and women, who are devoted to the deeper study of God's word, who spent all the time putting this together for us. And for our presenters today, the men and women who have already shared, who literally have spent another bunch of hours and hours uh, studying God's word so that we can have this presentation today. Men and women who are committed to following God's word. Yeah, and I think um, it also made me think about growing up in the church, you and mom, it was always a team effort. Um, and that really made me think of that. And um, I think as a single sister, I really enjoyed getting to hear from sisters from different walks of life. I think it's really easy um, as a single woman in the church to sort of feel like we don't have um, a voice or an important uh, space in the church. Um, so I'm really excited to see how our church is going to continue to grow in that way and, um, you know, just show how everybody has an important part. Amen. And as a husband of an amazing woman and the dad of an awesome daughter, I have a vested interest in how we study these things out, how we land in relation to the Bible and gender. And I am excited with what we've heard today to see what the future holds for people like my awesome single daughter over here. Very excited about that. Now, if you're anything like me, you may have been a little overwhelmed by the amount of teaching that we've heard today. And you may have thought, wait a minute, I think I misunderstood something. Wait, I, I didn't get it all. Don't worry. We're going to make all of this available to you so that you could do like I do and take bite-sized morsels, listen to it, watch it, and be able to come back and really maybe ask questions, maybe really understand what you've heard. And the Dawsons are coming up in just a minute or so to uh, summarize what we've been taught so that we can understand exactly where we're going right now. Now, just so you know, this is not the end of this study. We've been studying uh, this uh, topic of the Bible and gender. This topic has been studied out for hundreds of years. So we're going to continue to study it out. But what the Dawsons are going to share with you is where we are today in our journey. So thank you for joining us today and may God continue to watch over us. Hello, we are Ed and Nancy Dawson. Uh, we are from the Midpoint Ministry. I serve as an elder evangelist out there and Nancy serves as a women's ministry leader. We want to thank everyone for the time and effort put into this teaching day. Thank you to the presenters, to those who shared their perspective, our kingdom teachers from around the world that have studied the pertinent passages and have weighed in and helped inform and shape our present positions. Also, thank, we're thankful for the filming and editing crew who are working very hard on this project. Even though we have set some guidelines on this topic, we will continue to study this topic and many other topics and continue to seek God's wisdom. Mm -hmm. I'm so grateful for the spirit of cooperation and unity among our fellowship of churches around the world and the way that we're committed to God's word being our authority, our ultimate authority in our lives individually and corporately. And I really appreciate that we're attempting to allow the Bible to inform our thinking and our church culture and not trying to make the Bible fit culture. Here, we're gonna present a synopsis of the gender roles guidelines that the core leadership group of the Midwest landed on at this time. These were informed by the teaching that was presented today from the work of our ICOC global teachers. First of all, we do not feel that women should be appointed to the roles of evangelist, elder, or church leader. As is our current practice, women will continue to serve on staff and to contribute on the highest levels of our regional and con congregational leadership groups and church boards. Amen. We consider it appropriate for women to read scripture aloud as well lead public prayer in our ecclesiastical settings and corporate worship. Any authorized meeting of the church called by the leadership would fit into that category, Sunday worship, midweek, and house church. 
Though we continue to view men preaching and teaching in our public meetings, this also entails women sharing their thoughts and insights on the scriptures in the context of that sermon or lesson, as well as during communion. We see this as distinct from teaching, commanding, urging, and preaching, which is the responsibility given to men. Women are welcome to lead vocals in song in an ecclesiastical setting with appropriate tone and demeanor. In regards to leading the music ministry, the majority opinion here is that gifted women can lead the musical aspects of the ministry, but not the ecclesiastical aspects, though they are of course free to share verses and insights and lead prayer in those settings as they would in any other setting. In a non-ecclesiastical setting, female professionals can instruct in their areas of expertise, utilizing the scriptures to support their insights, such as in finance or counseling, to a mixed audience. It is our view that women should avoid authoritative urging, rebuke, or command. And in regard to a small group Bible study or house church of a mixed audience, the general thought is that we should encourage men's leadership, except in exceptional situations. As long as we remain within the final guidelines on which we land, individual congregations in the Midwest can make their own decisions regarding the specifics. Uh-huh, and as our practical decisions are implemented in the local congregations, we know there may be a time of development of these practices. There may even be some practices that will have to be corrected or altered to maintain general unity of practice throughout the Midwest. We are committed to unity and learning as we go forward. We trust the local leadership to work in harmony and unity with the Midwest churches and to implement practices with the best of intentions. You know, in conclusion, I love how God has created all equal in his eyes. Just like 1 Corinthians 12 says, every part of the body is important and every part of the body has a vital but sometimes different role. You know, if you have any questions from today's teaching day, we welcome those. You can submit those at the link below. We will go through your questions and try to address them in the near future. I hope this has helped us understand how God feels about women. We are his image bearers. This has been a process, and as disciples, we continue to learn and grow as we digest God's word and continue to be committed to fighting for our unity. Some of this may be hard, but we wrestle together with humility, with God's word as our standard. Women and men were created by God to equally reflect the nature and character of God. Women and men are not identical in every way. They were created by God for roles in family and in church that overlap but are not identical. Mm -hmm. In the family and in the church, women and men need to be empowered to use their gifts while fulfilling their gender specific roles. Don't worry if you didn't catch all that. If you have not already received it, you will be emailed a PDF with these Midwest guidelines in detail. We are so grateful for the humility and partnership within the leadership to continue to listen to what God is telling us through his word. We should move forward confidently, but with great humility. Thanks for joining us today for a day of teaching and sharing. We pray that you are edified as we continue to strive to build up the body of Christ together. Amen.